It's the Mixed Martial Arts Hour with... The Mixed Martial Arts Hour is back in your life. On this Wednesday, August 25th, 2021. Hello again, everyone. I'm Ariel Hawani. Welcome to another Wednesday edition. It's nice to say that. It's nice to say another Wednesday edition. That means we've already done at least one other Wednesday show. In fact, it's just been one. This is our fourth episode, the big triumphant return our second Wednesday show, week two, in the books, after today. I still don't know why people say in the books. Why isn't it a book? And where is this book? Who has possession of said book? I don't know, but that's what the kids say. And I have to be honest with all of you. I love the kids. I'm cool with the kids. No cap. Facts. That's all I can think of. But I'm getting really cool with the kids this week because after the show, I'm leaving on a jet plane to Cleveland. C-L-E, till I die. Till I die. Till I die. Till I die. Talking about boom, ba ba da ba 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 da ba da ba da 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 What's that song? You know the Machine Gun Kelly song? Stipe Miocic by man Mark Ramundi just reporting that Stipe is going to serve as the Dana White for the Jake Paul Tarn Willie face-off this Saturday. I'll be hosting it alongside some other notable people. It's going to be a good time, my friends. Big fight feel. Talking about that on this episode. Talking about other things as well. There's a ton going on. PFL back on Friday. You got UFC back on Saturday. There's one championship. There's LFA. I mean, there's a ton going on in the world of combat sports. And this is the home of all that discussion. I know there are a lot of new fans. I know there are a lot of new people in the game. I hope you have realized by now that there is one show of record. There is one place where all the big names want to come, where all the big names want to be guests. And I see some people online trying to stir the pot and say, oh, you don't have access to this, that, and the other. (laughs) Let me tell you something. There's a number outside the door. You can either take the number or you can go somewhere else. If you want to be heard from, you want to be seen, you come here. And that's just the facts. And that's an F-A-X. And that's no cap. And that's my blue hat coming off. That's no cap. So we've got a star-studded lineup for all of you today on the program. Later in the show, we're going to be joined by the one and only Chris Cyborg, the reigning, the defending, Bellator, women's featherweight champion. One of the greatest fighters of all time regardless of gender of course an absolute beast she's in colombia doing some work um over there we'll check in with her you may have seen last week um excuse me kayla harrison i know that wasn't great i mean what else am i supposed to do it's such a great mic that my man miles hooked up for me here where else am i supposed to clear my throat so i apologize for By the way, thanks to everyone who uh, continues to rate, download, subscribe, and review on Apple, Spotify, or on Stitcher. YouTube, of course. Shout out to the YouTube chat. That cesspool of humanity that I love so much. I say that, you know, from the, 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 you know, like the special place in my heart. I say that. I hope you don't mind that I, that I refer to you as such. I love you guys. You ride or die. Anyway, uh, back to Chris Cyborg. She'll be joining us at 3, 2.30. We're going to be joined by Misha Tate. Misha Tate's going to be calling the Invicta card also going down on Friday. Uh, just came back last month against Marion Renault. She's got that mom strength now. Great performance. Some reports out there, courtesy of the Brazilian Beast and others, that we're going to be doing uh, Caitlin Vieira versus Misha Tate in October. So that's an interesting fight. Talk to her about that and a whole lot more. At 2 o'clock, I've been wanting to talk to this man since his big win over Patricio Pitbull back in late July. We'll talk to AJ McKee, and um, he is the new Bellator featherweight champion. What's next for him? Is he getting paid? Is he moving up to 155? He's going to be a part of the Showtime broadcast on Sunday, too. I told you, it's a star-studded lineup. It's not just me. 
It's not just the goat, Moro Ronaldo. <clears throat> it's not just Al Bernstein. It's not just the Barstool guy. It's not just Logan Paul. It's AJ McKee, the mercenary himself. So that is going down at um, 2. And then at 1.30, we're going to be joined by Big Mouth himself, Kevin Holland. Talk about the coming and goings in his life. By the way, back into the show, arielhalwani.substack.com. I'm soliciting questions. If you want to shoot with the nose, maybe that's what I'll call it. Shooting with the nose. I've been thinking of a good name for this segment. If you want to shoot with the nose and you don't want to get your panties in a bunch and get all you know disappointed and upset and hot under the collar, if you want to shoot with the nose, you stick around at 3.30. I'll answer some questions. I'll take some of your questions, and then we'll call it a week. How about that? Appreciate all the love and support. Appreciate everyone who continues to check out the show, whether it's live or after the fact. And most importantly, I appreciate everyone who has come on in the last two weeks. And so for a long time, I've been wanting to talk to our first guest of the day. He has been in the news. He has been very active this year. He wasn't active last year, and that wasn't his doing. But of course, it was a crazy time to be alive. It's still a crazy time to be alive. But that's all in the rearview mirror. Why? Because he returns to action on Friday, part of the PFL tournament. He is one win away from moving on to the finals. He's going up against the very tough, the very game, Movlid Chaibuliev in the main event of the PFL event this Friday on the ESPN family of networks. He is the pride of Manchester, England. He is the one and only Brendan Lochnane who is kind enough to join us right off the bat via the magic of Zoom. Do we got him? Do we got, we got Brendan? Where's he at? There he is, the one and only uh, Brendan. What's going on, Brendan? How are you? What a fantastic <clears throat> introduction that was. Wow. Thank well, you, Ariel. I'm trying to get you pumped up for Friday, 48 hours away, Brendan. We are on this tour to prove everyone wrong, to shove it down the haters' throat. All of them. I'm not just talking about one, Brendan. I'm talking about all of them. You need me to fly down to Florida to be your hype man, to walk you out? What do you need from me? So far, so good, Ariel. Everyone, so far, so good. We're doing a good job, aren't we? Since the last time, well, since the first time we spoke, mm -hmm. we're just riding uh, an amazing wave. And wow, what a time to be alive, eh? It is. 48 hours away. Hopefully you uh, you get the opportunity to move on to the finals. What a time it has been for you. Have you stayed in America this whole time? Have you not gone back home? Because I see you in Vegas. I see what's been going on. Wow, I left my house on the 23rd of September Come last on. year. You're kidding. Um, nah, I'm not joking. I've not been home, not seen my family. I've just been uh, out here chasing the dream, as they say, the American dream. Is that because you can't go home because of COVID and the visa, or was that your choice? So it was a combination of things. First of all, uh, I couldn't go home was because PFL was like, you know, when you're here, like the borders are closing and things. I didn't want to take the risk. And as we're seeing with UFC London, people losing visas and can't get back out here. And it was yeah. for my own, my own thing. But I was like, well, I'm going to have to just find a way. And yeah, I mean, I've been on this journey now. Um, like I said, I left my house in September, went to Dubai six months came to the States. I've now been here since my first fight against Shaman. So yeah, it's been a roller coaster. That is unbelievable. Now, um, forgive me for prying. Do you have children? No. Okay. Uh, significant other? Yeah, I have a girlfriend and uh, yeah, my mom's on her own. So it's hard. It's, so you it's haven't really seen difficult. them since September, your significant other, your girlfriend and your mom, you haven't seen them since September? My girlfriend was in Dubai, so I've seen okay. her. Um, but, but yeah, my family, my friends, my godchildren, um, nope. And if you win this fight, the finals will be uh, in several weeks. What is it, end of October, I believe it is? Is it end of October? The 27th. Yeah, so will you just ride this out if all goes well? Are you going to ride this out to the very end? Well, I kind of like, I've kind of made it a thing now to not yeah. go home without the belt and the check. I'm like, nah, I'm not coming home until I, I can envision myself throwing the, the belt in the, in the suitcase and going, right, now I'm coming home. I love it. What a great story that would be, especially considering everything that you've been through. I saw an interview with you, Brendan, recently, and I got to call you out on this because you know what? I like uh -oh. you a lot, but I'm going to call uh -oh. BS on this, Brendan. I'm calling BS. Uh -oh. You said that the PFL belt means more to you, correct me if I'm wrong, than the million dollar check. <laughs> there is no chance in hell that that is true. I mean, let's just be honest. It's a million dollars, Brendan. That's life-changing money. There's no chance that that is actually true, correct? 
Okay, let me pick that apart for a second. Let's when go. I was on your show, how how down was I? Was I very, down? Very down. Very, very down. Okay, so to come from that to where I am now, I feel like it symbolizes going from getting told, no, nope, you're not good enough, you're not that guy, and then to go on the roller coaster that I've been on and to get that piece of metal, yeah, a million dollars is fantastic, but what I said was, money does come and go in your life, and it always will do, it'll always pass through your hands, but that, I was just look at it and go, I did it. I know what it represents. I know that it's something that you could put on your mantle. I know it's something that, you know, you can tell your children about all that. But, uh, you know, that's, again, you've done great things. I know with the signing bonus, you bought your mom her house, right? You paid it off. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yeah. you could do great things for your family. You can't necessarily go to the bank and, you know, plop that belt down there and get some money out of the ATM, right? That's all I'm saying. Well, listen, a million dollars is a million dollars, but yeah. once you U.S. tax men get hold of uh, it and once everyone else gets the little fingers in it, it doesn't look like a million dollars at the I end. I, by the way, is it a million dollars on top of your purse or is that like the cumulative number? To be confirmed, I think it's a cumulative. Okay, oh, uh, either way. Because I, I'm not going to turn my nose up at 800,000, you know what I mean? Of course, of course, <laughs> absolutely. Obviously, every time you fight, the story is, oh, this was the guy who looked so good on Contender Series. Dana White said he couldn't get in because he went for the shot with five seconds left. There's the gif, all that nonsense, whatever. Does it bother yeah. you that that is continuously a thing that is attached to you every time? Look what he's doing. Look how he's proving them wrong. This that. Does that annoy you? Or has it kind of given you an identity? Has it rallied your fans <laughs> around you? Has it actually ended up being a good thing for you? Well, you did tell me. If you're not mistaken, you're like, Brendan, this will work out better for you. And at the time, I couldn't see it. A lot of people were saying that this is going to be better in the long run. Um, but I feel like it's something that's always going to be attached to my career. So I have to embrace it. What's the point in saying, oh, I don't want it? Every time it's brought up in an interview, it gets brought up three or four times a day in interviews. Yeah. Like, I'm that guy. Like, it's always going to be attached to me. It's part of my story now. And I feel like you're watching a real-life Rocky story unfold under your eyes. That's, that's literally what it's been called. Well, it, it, it has made you into somewhat of a sympathetic figure, an underdog, someone that people want to rally around. And, uh, and, and and then you come back after the year off, after the COVID shutdown of PFL, they took the hiatus last year, and then you get that amazing win in the finish. I would venture, I mean, how many, off the top of my head, how many wins we got here? We got uh, 21 wins at this point. So that was two wins ago. So going into that fight, you had 19 wins, if my math is correct here. Yeah. I would imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, you have never felt better at any point in your athletic career than you did right after you knocked out Shaman Rice. Is that accurate? Did you see how crazy I went? I was <laughs> screaming. I was, ah! That was just so much pent up emotion of a the year and a half off, the the contender series, the the people putting me as a massive betting underdog. I was plus seven thousand to win this tournament. Plus seven thousand. Wow. Here I am. Was it that exactly? I'm oh sat God. as the number one seed. Exactly. I'm sat as the number one seed now. And it's like I'm saying, I told you so. I mean, what a great finish. What an exclamation point. You're you're the underdog going into this fight on Friday too, right? Every time. <laughs> Is that crazy? Did you bet on yourself plus 7,000? Please tell me you did, or at least someone you know did. So I only found that out not long ago. Somebody DM'd me on Twitter who's a professional gambler, and he was like, thanks, bro. Like, you're oh making me some money God. every time you are making me money. And I'm like, I'm not going to say no name, but this guy has made a lot of money so far. Well, good for him. Uh, that is unbelievable. Plus 7,000 sounds crazy to me. Has anyone ever told you, explained to you, there has to be another reason why they didn't pick you up, right? Like, you know the real story. What's the real story? It can't be that takedown with five seconds left. <laughs> I refuse to believe this, Brendan. There has to be something that is the real reason behind the scenes as to why this didn't happen. What is it? Tell us. I wish I knew Ariel. I would share it with you. No comment. No comment? No comment. I, I just don't know. I really don't know. I mean, uh, maybe it was the takedown. Who knows? That is a crazy. Do you even watch it? Are you able to watch the product? Or do you have sort of disdain for it? No, not at all. Listen, the UFC is the UFC. I love watching the UFC. I've got so many friends that are fighting in the UFC. I actually don't hate Dana White. Everyone's like, oh, I don't. I think he's hilarious. I'll still watch all his interviews. I have no hatred towards that man whatsoever. No hatred towards the UFC. I'm happy with the journey that I'm on now. It's made me the man who I am now. It made me grab my nutsack and go, right, do you really want this? And it made me it made me into the fighter that I am now. Okay. All right. Well, it's good that you don't have that hate in your heart. The the English fans can be a very passionate bunch, a very loyal bunch. Like we've seen, of course, what they did for Michael Bisping, 
Darren Till now. Do you feel that love from them, or do you still feel maybe because you're not in the UFC yet that they haven't rallied around you as much as, you know, Till, Bisping, even Leon Edwards these days as well? It's hard for me to tell her, because I've not been home since September, like I said. So well, I'll give you an example. One of my best friends, he was away for six months, and he came home and he went, Brendan, people are just stopping me in the street, my hairdresser, the guy at the local store, like, oh, Brendan's doing amazing things. And I don't know if you've noticed, Sky Sports have picked it up now, yeah. ESPN, the inside, are like, it's going up and up every time. Um, so it feels like it's gaining momentum, but it's hard to tell when I'm not at home. Uh, but we are very loyal. I've always had a loyal support. Like, you know, I've got a few soccer player friends, a few boxer friends, and everyone stayed in touch. And it does feel like everyone's getting behind me. And, it, you know, it doesn't go it doesn't go unnoticed or underappreciated ever. I notice, uh, you know, obviously when uh, Darren Till fights, uh, Liverpool will support him. When Molly McCann fights, my beloved... Everton Football Club will support her as well. Why don't I see Manchester United supporting you? Or are you a Man you City? Are you a Man City you guy? Did, wait, hold on, hold on. You did see the United. You've seen the Rashford videos. You've seen the Lingard videos. You've seen the United team sending out videos. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're, they're all on board. That was, that was, wasn't that like two years ago? Where's the support yeah, right well, now? Well, Where's the support right now, Brendan? I want it now. I want a tweet from the Manchester account. That's a good point. I better get back onto these guys and like I need it now more than ever, yeah? Yeah, I mean, we're right there. We're on the precipice. We're on the doorstep of a million dollars. This is unbelievable. You've been training with a lot of famous people, Brendan, over your uh, your almost year away from home. I saw you with Freddie Roach, right? Yeah, yeah. What yeah. was that like? I mean, I've trained with Freddie Roach on and off for about two or three years now. Um, yeah. And when I say train with him, I'm not going to be that guy. He doesn't pad me. You know, I've sparred one of these guys. I go in there. And I just have really cool conversations with him. Like last time I was there, I finished my workout. An hour and a half of old school stories oh, about all amazing. the old boxes. Yeah. Yeah. I love Freddie Roach time. Yeah. It was sick. That is amazing. I bet he's got stories for days with the, you know, the, the guys that he's cornered. Also, uh, were you training with Frank Mir as well? Frank Mir was the head coach at Syndicate where I just did my last camp. Yeah. But I, I knew Frank from. A long time ago, because Frank um, actually commentated all my ACB fights. Uh-huh. So we would go out after, me and Frank were cool anyway. And he, and he came to Manchester for a while as well. Is that, he's a glorified bank, Frank, there on the slide. He's a glo- is he really? Yeah, he is, he is. He spent a lot of time in Manchester. Once you've done over like six weeks and you've been with the boys, you're a glorified bank. You understand the lingo. You okay. Know? You know, I've been to Manchester once. It was for uh, 48 hours. I did a, a pay-per-view thing with Connor. We did like a sit-down interview, and there was a black tie event and all that. I didn't get to see much, but I felt the love there. I, I felt like they welcomed me with open arms. Oh, wait, wait, hold on. Yeah. You went to Manchester and yeah. didn't go to a football game. It was literally, it might have even been 36 hours. It might have even been less. It was It was a, a, a January in 2017, I think it was. It How was, dare you have yeah. that Everton cup in the back? <laughs> and go to England and not go to a football game. Wow. I, know. I was in and out. I was all biz. I was all biz. Um, so, so okay, so you have these famous guys that you kind of dabble with, but as far as your coaches are concerned, have they been able to travel back and, home, back and forth, or are they staying with you, or do you have to get new coaches to corner you for these fights in America? What so, are you doing? This man that you can see here. Oh, Joe, I see a hand. Yep, yep. He, he, he as my first coach from when I was 16 years old, taught me my first punch. And he's still my coach now. Uh, 13 years deep we are. And he's only ever missed one corner. And that was the last one just due to coronavirus and couldn't get back in and out. Seems to like Florida have eased up now. Because don't forget, Ariel, it was a 17-day quarantine. Uh, And then when he went home, he had to do another 10 days. So 27 days for a two-minute fight. (laughs) I mean, it would have been with pleasure. It's uh, probably a little worse if you lose. But I can understand why. So now there's no quarantine, right? Well, I think it's quarantine, but it's very loose. It's like three days, four days. Uh, But, yeah, I mean, at least, you know what? At least they got us fights. Nobody got pulled off the car due to corona. I see why they did it, and it worked. Prior to uh, the beginning of this season, that fight against Shaman Rise, the incredible knockout, a knockout we'll probably be talking about in December when we're talking about the year-end awards, Your, your previous fight was December of 2019, so we're talking a year and a half. How difficult was that for you to be on the sidelines? At that point, you know, come summer of 2020, UFC is back and rolling. Fight Island and Vegas, Bellator is back, boxing is back, and PFL made the decision uh, to take the year off. 
you sitting on the sidelines and seeing everyone getting fights and getting paid and not being able to be active, considering all the drama of the previous year and contenders, mentally, how difficult was it? Oh, it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. I was 30 years old. I was going into that season like I was about to go into this season, like to win it, to put on these performances. I've always been capable of these performances. And I flew out to Thailand in January. I got all the way up until I think it got cancelled in April. I got, I'd done a full camp and I was like four or five weeks away from the first event. And then I got told it was getting pulled till the following April. I was like, what? So once it got pulled for that long, I mean, I was sparring Peter Yan for that. I was sparring Raphael Faziev. I was in their camps for when he was fighting Aldo. Wow. So I was just like, you know, I'm, I'm here now. Like, let's just carry on. Like, I had two options. It was either go and find something else to do for a year and a half or stick to your craft master it even more and then when the time comes back you'll be more than ready and that's what i did uh did you consider uh i know they were giving those payments monthly payments and all that did you take that or did that not really do much for you yeah i got paid for the time off okay so do you feel like overall are you happy with pfl you know no one could have expected last year to go down the way it did but do you feel like they've treated you well are you content with them listen with pfl right they took me at a low time when I just happened on the contender. They gave me a signing bonus, which I was able to do, you know what, with. And then after that, I fought at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> and then I fought at the Mandalay Bay. Two dreams were ticked off immediately. And now I'm one fight away from a million dollars, well, $800,000 or whatever it is. But, like, who would have thought it? You couldn't write this. This is a real-life Rocky story unfolding in front of us. And thank you to the PFL, man, like, for picking me up at that time and realizing my star potential because I've always had it in me. I'm not just saying this because you're, you know, in front of me here, but from a production standpoint, um, the look, the feel of the events, the broadcast, like I feel like PFL has grown up a lot. Like when I watch them, I don't think, oh, there's the number three promotion. I don't th like I don't feel like it's an inferior product. I think the roster has gone better. Some of the signings haven't panned out this year, but that's the sport of MMA. You're not it's not pro wrestling. Not you can't script it. I feel like they've had a great year thus far. I mean, there's still a couple of events left, but thus far a great year. Like when you watch it, do you feel the same? Do you feel like this is a, a legit professional, you know, mainstay in the world of MMA that's not going anywhere? Well, I have fought for a lot of major promotions. I have fought in the UFC. I have fought in the UFC card. I have fought in ACB. I have fought in some big shows, and it's the big show feel. Like you get here, look at this hotel. The hotel's amazing. That I'm in. You know, you get looked after, and then when you turn up on fight night, it's professional. Um, and the products that you actually watch on TV, the new cameras that they've got, the HD, and I'm like watching it, and like, wow, this this show has stepped up a lot. I mean, what is it, the third or fourth season? I mean, they're doing great things and they're on the ESPN. They've got that ESPN deal, which is amazing. Um, so I feel like PFL are going to be a force to reckon with in the future for sure. I read, and correct me if I'm wrong, a neighbor was the one who introduced you to MMA many moons ago, a neighbor of yours. Is that accurate? Yep. So what happened was he was an MMA fighter when MMA wasn't even a thing. We're talking about 2007, 2006. And then he was like, I was coming home from school. It was one of them headlocks straight in the back of the car. Come on, son. And I never looked back. Wow. And is this man still around? This man is still around. I'm still very close. I am actually the godfather to his children. Wow. Um, I'm eternally grateful to Benjamin Walker. I love that I said his name as well. Well, I'm happy that you said his name. I was just going to ask you to give him a shout out. I mean, do you ever, does he ever say to you, I can't believe that what, you know, like this turned into all of this. Like I was just trying to maybe show you a few moves and now you're a pro fighter on the verge of all these great things. Do you ever have that conversation with him? Well, it's, it's so funny you say that because I was actually speaking to him a few days ago and me and Ben are very close and I always looked up to him and I only ever seen Ben cry once. It was on his wedding day. I went to his wedding and he was like, and this guy was the cage fighter. So he was like, wow, did he just cry? Is it okay for Ben to cry? And then we were actually talking. Uh, about a week ago and I started saying, you know, I've not been home, I've not seen my family, this, that, and he just started crying. Oh. I was like, whoa. Yeah, and he was like, he goes, I'm so fucking proud of you on what you've done. Like, look at you, look at what you're doing since since I put you in the back of that car. You've just not turned back and you've gone for it. I'm so proud of you, son. I was like, whoa. And that took me back. It did. Wow, you're giving me goosebumps. Um, how old were you when, when he first, you know, was showing you in the back of the car and all that stuff? How old were you? Well, he... He was my next door neighbor for five years or six years. So I was always watching him. And then it was towards my last year in high school, like 16, when I was kind of ready. And then that's when he took me. What do you think you would be doing if 
you don't meet this man and he doesn't show you this sport, but like, well, what do you think your life is like? I knew I would have been successful. I'm, I'm so gritty and determined. As you can see from my MMA career, it speaks volumes of what type of person I am. I'm extremely resilient. I don't back down. And whatever I would have put my hand to, I would have been successful. I feel like I'm an artist at heart as well because I do embrace the mixed martial arts side of it. There have been ups and downs, as we've documented. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there have been times where you even thought about quitting, right? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, and, and a fighter would be lying if he said the thought of quitting MMA didn't cross the mind at some point. When's the last time you thought about quitting? Oh, God, that was the last time I was talking to you. It, it was last that time bad. I was talking to you. I was pissing blood. I had a broken nose. I had my dreams crushed. And I was like, this is all I've ever worked for. Where do I go now? What do I do now? And then... You know, when you had me on this, I remember what, I, yeah, I can't even watch that interview, you know. I really can't watch our last interview back because wow. it just brings back how I, how I felt at that time. And to come from there to be this smiley guy in front of you now, what a time. It's a beautiful thing. But how long, like those wounds, how long did they take to, uh, to heal for you to feel a bit better about training and getting back on the horse, so to speak? How long did you mourn what happened on the Contender Series? Not long, because PFL was straight in with a massive mm. offer. PFL yeah. were like, hey, listen, like Bellator had an offer and one championship. I had a few. So, like, I had to kind of move fast. I didn't have time to mope around, which was good, really. I didn't have time to sit and think about it too much. I was just back on the horse. But definitely for the first few days, I was thinking, what now? Dominic Cruz with you over there? Not this time, but I did do my, not this camp, the last camp with Dominic. But he's always on the phone. And he's okay. always supportive. Yeah, um, I like your relationship very much. Uh, Movlid is is a tough guy, wrestler, another one of those tough Dagestani fighters. I, I feel like you know what he's going to bring to the table here, right? How do you feel about going up against one of those guys? Because it always feels like the worst night possible going up against them. They're, just, they're miserable to fight. I mean, all credit to them. They're incredible, but they just make life very miserable for their opponent is what I mean. Listen, anyone from that gym, from that, you know, from that trains around Khabib or with Khabib or from there, because he, a lot, like, he actually does train with Khabib, you know what I mean? Like, he's not just one of them, like, he is his sparring partner, his pictures are inspiring, whatever. Um, and he's 17 and 0, so he's got the Khabib aura. But I'm not scared of no one, and people are forgetting who I am. 21 and 3, I'm the top seed. I'm the one that went through as the top seed. Like, don't forget, put some respect on my name, too. Let's like, go, everyone, Brendan. Like, I'm, I'm just sick of the interviews, though. Like, have you watched these flying knees? You know, he's trained with Khabib, you know, and I'm like, Yes, I do know. I have seen his highlight flying knees. Have you seen my flying knees? Like, that's, what, that's, how, that's my response. Good man. Good man. I love it. Well, it goes down this Friday. You are back. What a great story. It's one of my favorite stories in MMA right now, what you've been able to do this year. And uh, coming off of last year, you may, you may have lost momentum, and you, didn't, and you came back with a vengeance, and you're shoving it down everyone's throat. And you're an inspiration to anyone out there who's been told, hey, you can't do this, or I'm going to be your roadblock, and you're not good enough, and you can't enter this club. That's you. And I hope people realize it, and I hope people are rooting for you and telling you that, because you are an inspiration, my friend. It's a beautiful story that we got to see unfold in front of our eyes. Sometimes when someone gets told no, I'm sorry for going on this tangent here, but I feel like I have to. When someone gets told no, when someone gets told that their dreams aren't going to be realized, it happens behind the scenes. It happens in some room. It happens on the phone. It happened to you on national television. And so we all got to see that. And so that's why everyone's hitching their wagon to you and pulling for you and emotionally invested in your journey. And I hope it all pans out for you with that big million dollar check later on this year, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for exposing my journey even further and getting me on here so everyone can see you know, on, what, what, what it's been for the last year or two. So, yeah, thank you, Ariel. Appreciate it. All the best to you. We'll be watching on Friday. Good luck, Brendan. Thank you so much. All right, there he is, Brendan Lochnane, the number one seed in the PFL tourney. Goes down this Friday. 145 pounds. It's, I believe, uh, 145 and I do believe 155. Fun Comain, Chris Wade against Bubba Jenkins. Let me get centered here. Uh, Antonio Carlos Jr., Shoeface, also on the card against Emiliano Sordi, who's a PFL mainstay. Cesar Muchanch against Martin Nelson. Shaman Rice, the aforementioned Chris Camozzi. It's a nice little card. Listen, they're doing things. Jason Knight. 
again, as I've said time and again, as I have said time and again, we want competition in MMA. When I say we, if you are a fan of the sport and you are a fan of fighters, you always want competition. You always want the fighters to have options. I know it's good when you have one place with one massive umbrella where everyone can fight and you get your dream matchups. I know that's good. It's nice. It's tidy. It's a little package. I get it. But the more options, the more competition, the better. And, you know, I was doing that uh, WWE stuff last week. And uh, one thing that occurred to me was, you know, those AEW fans and just stick with me here. Don't get all freaking upset when I uh, start mentioning wrestling. Those AEW fans are so, so passionate. They are so loyal. I mean, it's almost to the point of delusion, but I love it. I respect it. Live or die. They want their organization to succeed. They want them to take down the big bad wolf, WWE. We don't have that in MMA. Bellator doesn't have that. You talk about Bellator and it's like, eh, F off. They don't have that passion. Strike Force had it. Pride had it. Why don't, why doesn't PFL have it? Why doesn't Bellator have it? Why doesn't a number two or three or four promotion? There's no one in the sport outside, like UFC has it, but there's no one saying, let's go live and die. You know, Cage Warriors has it a little bit, but it's on the European scene. It's not quite. You know, worldwide, obviously, they're coming over to America, but like, there's nothing in MMA like what the AEW fans bring to the table. And I think that would be good. It would be nice to see that rather than people rolling their eyes and whatnot. Um, and so I am a fan of competition. I am a fan of options. I'm a fan of the fighters getting as much as they can possibly get. All right. Thank you very much to Brendan Lochnane. Uh, that goes down on Friday. Now, uh, let us go back to this Zoom machine and say hello to our next guest. Very excited to talk to Mr. Kevin Holland, who is kind enough to join us. The one and only Kevin Holland. I haven't talked to him in quite some time. They call him Big Mouth. I call him Mr. Y'all Must Have Forgot because very soon he's going to come back and he's going to recreate what he did in 2020. Everyone's having a grand old time kicking this man while he's down. Oh, he's lost two in a row. He can't wrestle and whatnot. I see what you're doing out there in Texas, Kevin. I know what you're doing. I see you in the lab. I'm looking forward to the return in October. But first, hello, my friend. It's good to talk to you again. Thank you. Appreciate that. It's nice to talk to you as well. How you been? What do we got over there? Ben and Jerry's? What is that over your right shoulder? Yeah, it's, it's my little shoe collection over there. That's some good, of my shoe collection. That is nice. How many pairs do you have? That's 60 right there with a couple laying around. 60? Six zero? Yeah, that's just 60. How many do you have total? Kind of like another like 60 downstairs earlier without the box, with all the boxes that were together. So somewhere around like about 140 jeez man that's a lot that's a, i mean is that is do you really need that many shoes do you feel like it's necessary probably not but <laughs> you know it's definitely necessary for me <laughs> all right fair enough um we got a lot to talk about first off kevin congratulations on the new deal you recently signed a new contract with the ufc now was your contract up or was it one of those where there were a couple fights left and they just wanted to re-sign you i had one fight left so it was like you know I don't know. I just woke up one day and Orrin was like, yo, we got a new contract. And I was like, yo, sweet. Sign it. Pretty sure it's better than the last one. So was it better? I was happy. Yeah. I mean, it's way better than the last one. I mean, I mean, it's, it's to me, it, I think it's super great coming off two losses. You know what I mean? And then I, I think it's, I think it's a fantastic contract. I, I can't complain. I'm happy with it. I'm super happy with it. Were you surprised that they wanted to renegotiate coming off of two losses, give you a new contract and not maybe see how the next one goes? You know, I didn't think that like I was going to just get like cut like that. But uh, at the same time, you never know. It's the UFC. They don't really need per se anybody. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you just got to play your role and see how things go. So no, I was I was super happy with the contract. A little surprised, not super surprised. I figured something would happen before the fight. I didn't know uh, how big or how small it would be. But I mean, like I said, I was surprised when I when I seen it. I was like, Yo, Orange, you did your thing, dog. K.O. Rips, baby. K.O. Gang, let's go. You got to make the team happy, baby. That's right. You know That's I mean? right. That's what it's all about, getting paid. Now, let me ask you, um, this time last year, you were en route to that amazing year, five wins, all that stuff, undefeated in 2020. 
I'm assuming your confidence was high. You don't strike me like the kind of guy whose confidence is ever really low despite what's going on in the cage. But how would you describe right now how you're feeling about your career, about you know your confidence, your place in the sport coming off those two fights earlier this year? Uh, I feel good. I feel good. I know I know what the top five has to offer. You know, it's like uh, they're not the best in the top five, but I, I know what the top five has to offer. Uh, the striking, you know, maybe when I go against some of the strikers in the top five, it'll be a little different. But uh, no, I know what they have to offer. It was a, a valuable, valuable information to, uh, you know, put inside the computer, download. And it was motivating, you know, and it's like uh, most people just get motivated off wins. Some the type of person that sometimes has to bump his head to realize that I need to fix and do some things. So, yeah, it's really good. I'm looking forward to the to, to the comeback. Do you regret taking the Vittori fight? No, not at all. Not at all. It's it's a great story. You know, and it's like uh he beat me, he lost to uh, Izzy again, you know, it's like he got his way in. I was I was the person that got somebody to the title. I talked all that crap about uh <laughs> Brunson and uh, the the you know, the gatekeeper that I pulled up and took his job. So, you know, no problem. It's I don't I don't regret anything. What did you think of Marvin's performance against Izzy in June? Exactly like I told him in the cage after we fought, you know, work on your striking before you go fight him. He didn't work on his striking before he went and fought him, and he got looked like he looked like a clown out there trying to hit him. You know, it's like uh, I thought he had really good takedowns against me. His takedowns weren't so good there. Granted, Izzy just probably had better hips and uh, understood the game plan. I just think that Israel did a really, really good job of shutting Marvin down, and that's the end of it. You know, Marvin really, really needs to go to the lab and do what I'm doing now, just in reverse roles. Wait a second. In the cage back in April, you actually said to him, you, 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 like you gave him that advice right after the well, fight? Well, he told me, I work on her. yeah, he said, I work on your wrestling. I was <laughs> like, work on your, you know, so I was like, Damn. You know, he didn't have to say ways. that. I mean, I feel like that's a little bit of a low blow, no? No, no, no. I mean, you know, it is what it is. You know, it's like, we're all fighters here. I don't care what they say. I hope they don't care what I say. Fair enough. Now, um, after the fight, you said you were going to Dagestan. Did you actually ever consider going to Dagestan? No, you can't smoke in Dagestan, so I've never considered it. No. You, uh, did you consider it until you found out that you couldn't smoke, or did you know that beforehand you were just messing around? No, nah, I just, I just always knew like the plane flight was going to be too long, and then sure. we got on the plane, and I was like, "Yo, they want me to go to Dagestan," and then uh, my buddy Cowboy was like. You can't smoke weed in Dagestan. And Trevor was like, yep, can't smoke weed in Dagestan. And I was like, I'll stay here in America, you know? So I went I went out there to AKA, though. Got some work with uh, DC and Duran, you know? Yeah. Really, I went to Gil. So it was, it was cool, you know? Okay. I, did, I did part of the journey. Okay, so uh, <laughs> let us clear up this, uh, this trip to the Bay Area, if I can, because I see all kinds of stuff about it. You went out to the Bay Area... You 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 saw my main man DC. You went to his uh, his wrestling club over there, right in Gilroy, correct? How long did you spend there? I spent like what, like three four days. You know, not long. And Business what was week. the experience like? It was great. I thought it was fantastic. I mean, uh, the the they call them kids, but little Robins over there. You know, a bunch of little vigilantes. You know what I mean? They're uh, they're amazing, dude. They're really good at wrestling. Their uh, their mindset's strong. You know, everything they what they want to do it, they do it. I mean, I thought it was great. I thought DC does a really good job of coaching the kids and stuff. I thought it was fantastic. You know, I thought I thought the the wrestling camp that DC puts together over there, I really think it's top tier. Uh, I wish we had something like that a little closer. Maybe we do have something like that a little closer. And I'm not good enough at wrestling, so I'm not invited. But I mean, that was that was pretty dope. You know, so I had a good time. DC is real cool. Duran's real cool. I mean, more. It was better than what I expected. So I I can't complain. Why'd you only stay for three four days? Why not? few weeks ah man i was gonna go back and try it again but uh when i was on my way back i noticed that Shab shabazian shabazian i even say his name was there and i was like yeah i really don't want to train with that guy i want to fight him so i was like yeah and then i didn't really like the idea of like training somewhere that luke rockhold was at because i went to aka one day and uh i seen luke rockhold on the wall and i was like bro i want to fight him so it was like you know it was dope to be at aka the legendary gym but you know just not me you know yeah. i'm trying to keep it Gotta keep it Texas, baby. I feel you. Know, you. I, I, happy, I mean, you baby. gotta stay home. Yeah, no, for sure. So you yeah, kind of felt like a bit of a fish out of water there. It wasn't really for you. It was nice experience. Good to get that knowledge, those reps, whatever. But in the end, it didn't feel like home. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, AKA Gil Gilred. You know, on the other hand, you know, it felt like a great spot. You know, you know, it felt like a good camp. 
away from camp. felt like a good spot to go. You know what I mean? I really, really liked it there. I thought it was nice. Different vibe than what I'm used to when I go to Houston and stuff like that. But it was more, to me, it was more peaceful. You know what I mean? You had the water not too far and stuff like that. It was real nice. I just couldn't do the AKA thing because my the way my sights and the way that my things are set. You know, if I could ever get the chance to take out some people on the roster, you know, as a, as a Luke or a Shabazzian and they're going to be training there, then, you know, the hit list has to remain the hit list. And so th- that's where it gets interesting because then I see a clip with Javier Mendez, the head man over there, saying how you never went to AKA and how you know he heard that you know the kids in Gilroy were giving you a hard time. But then I saw pictures. Oh, was, I saw you and Duran. Destroyed me. Yeah, those kids at Gilroy destroyed me. So I mean, uh, Javier Mendez isn't wrong on that. I mean, those kids are great at wrestling. If you even want to call them kids, yeah. I mean, no, I've seen those kids. They're beasts. You know, so they're not kids. That, that that's awesome. I mean, nothing special happened to me at AKA. Granted, I probably gave different energy when I was at one place versus another place. But at the end of the day, I have all respect for the people. So if they ain't got respect for me, my phone number, it's easy to get a hold of too. My Instagram, easy to get a hold to. You know what I mean? So anybody ever has something to say to me, they can say it, bro. I mean, you know. But I saw you and Duran at AKA. Like you were actually there. I mean, yeah, I got. I mean, I got the pictures. You know, there's a lot of people. With them. When I pulled up, they wanted pictures. There's plenty of pictures around. They're a great group of people. They were fantastic. I don't see what the animosity is. Maybe he didn't like when I said that, you know, it wasn't for me. I mean, it's it's a great place, legendary gym, but I'm just trying to keep it Texas. You know, gotta keep it, gotta keep the team happy, baby. I feel you. I feel, I, did, now, did you even actually see him in person? Never. No. All right. You and Duran get along? Yeah, I think Duran's cool. Yeah. I mean, you know, he ain't that good. At, he ain't that good at Call of Duty, yeah. but you know, that's a whole other story. But okay. you know what I mean? It's, it's okay. <laughs> then the story gets interesting. You go home, and all of a sudden, I see you training with the great Johnny Hendricks, legend Johnny Hendricks, yeah. longtime UFC fighter, WC fighter, Oklahoma State legend. How did that happen? How did that pairing come about? It was actually I got offered to do it a while back. And I was like, nah, you know what I mean? Like, I'm going to stick with Travis. But then after going out there and just being, like, completely humble, you know what I mean, on TV for, you know, pretty much 50 minutes of my life, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, you start, uh, it's like, I should probably improve. So, uh, no disrespect to Travis or anything, but I realized that I had to get better at some other departments when it came to grappling. You know, it's like, I can I can do jiu-jitsu. One man's takedown was always the start of my jiu-jitsu until one man's takedown was strong, super strong, and I couldn't move that man around. So, uh, yeah, Warren reached out to Johnny. Johnny came through, and uh, I just instantly was like, yo, this is a legend. Let me learn from him. You know what I mean? I guess after the experience I had with DC, I was like, yo, I can learn from these dudes that really know how to wrestle. So, yeah, it was it was dope. Now they started calling me, you know, Kevin – I can name off or however you said my last name was going to be now. Now they can call me Kevin Big Rig Holland, baby. I love Let's it. Go. I love it. How, yeah. how far away is his gym from where you live? Uh, honestly, I don't I don't know if he still has a gym or not. I don't, I've don't. i never been to his gym. I uh, don't know if he still does that. I think he's a full-time cop now. I think Johnny's yeah. full-time cop. Yeah. He comes in, coaches me down over here in the Fort Worth area. We actually go to War Room over there with uh, Stephen Wright, uh, the castle, the Metroplex, one of the, one of the OG gyms over here in the uh, DFW. Originally was a weightlifting gym, but you have a little spot in there where you can do uh, martial arts as well. Okay. So we actually meet up there and we get it in. It's a real gritty spot, very hot, and I love it. You know, it's that grimy feel. So are you no longer training with Travis Luter and company over there? Uh, I just simply don't. I just simply don't go there right now because of uh, I'm trying to focus on the MMA and the wrestling. You know, yeah. what I mean, Travis will always be like a father to me. You know, and that team will always be a, a home of mine. But you know, lately I've been focusing on some other things. So no hard feelings, basically. Let's not make a whole big thing about it. You're just, you know, trying to get some other looks. Yeah, just getting some other looks, you know. Okay. Never, never, never that alone, but I, I got to do what I got to do. Johnny going to corner you? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, big rig in the corner would be a nice side. That would be you nice. Know, uh, you know, so, I mean, I think the people not only wanted to see Big Mouth come back and, um, be big mouth again, but they wanted to see some improvements in some different areas and the areas were a lot of different areas and I can fulfill all of those areas. I know I can, you know, it's all about just being uh, open-minded. So cornering is, was one of those things. And so we're just bringing in a couple of different people who just more focus on the MMA base. You know, Travis has a, a big job of being, you know, one of the number one guys in jiu-jitsu in the DFW. So, you know, it's hard to focus on that and then have to focus on me and I'm the only fighter there. So just had to make some changes, you know, to benefit him and to benefit myself as well. It, so we'll probably have Johnny. It feels uh, it feels right. Big rig, big mouth. 
the two bigs coming together, Team Big, I don't know. Everything's bigger in Texas, right? And everything's bigger in Texas. That is right. Now, uh, you are fighting on October 2nd, Kyle Dawkins. What did you make of this yes. matchup when it was offered to you? Uh, I really thought it was a great matchup for me personally to get back into it. Very motivating matchup. He uh, he gave Brandon Allen a really tough fight. Last second notice that he took it, you know. He gave uh, Phil Hayes a good competition, even though I think Phil Hayes was very pretty much dominant in that fight. I've learned a lot watching both of his fights in the UFC. I watched some old video. I'm not really a guy who watches video like that, but I felt I felt it was necessary coming forward on this uh, on this new one around. And uh, I like I like the way Kyle fights a lot. And I think I think Kyle's so down to do it all, you know. And then I like the idea that he has a big brother, and you know, I mean, his big brother might whoop my ass if I whoop his too bad. So it's it's, it's very interesting, and I'm I'm very excited about it. I mean. I really like the Kyle Dawkins fight. A lot of people don't understand who he is. I understand who he is. I understand the guy was pretty much what, undefeated before he got to the UFC. The guy has a problem. So it's going to be fun. Yeah, his brother's a big boy, Chris Dawkins. Um, You know how it is. When you're riding high, everyone wants a piece, hitting you up, talking about you, blowing you up, all that stuff. What's it like now? Do you feel like people are sleeping on you? Do you feel like they're not talking about you? Do you not feel the, you know, Instagram? Not, like, what's the difference between this Kevin Holland and last year's Kevin Holland? I mean, no, I mean, Instagram, they, they do me right. I love okay. Instagram. All right. I'm mean, all up, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm surfing. I'm trying to catch Darren Till. That's my job. My job is to catch Darren Till on the followers. You You're know good. You're good on Instagram. Although I noticed that you deleted a lot of your old pictures. Like, they only go back to last year. Why is that? I mean, a lot of a lot of the old sponsors weren't paying money anymore, so a lot oh, of the old sponsors. Oh, that's how it goes, huh? Yeah, this is a money game, you know. So for me, social media and stuff like that, it's not a it's not something where I just get to go have fun. At. It's a platform for my business, and uh, you know that's that's business. And so I, I hate to be like that, but business is business. They have old banners; they can take pictures of those and post those. But that's on my I never media. thought of that. I never thought of that. If the deal is up and they're not paying or whatever, they got to yeah. go. Yeah, free game for all the other fighters out there. You know what I mean? That is Thank smart. Thank me later. <laughs> well, your guy, yeah. Oren, does a great job with that, so uh, he deserves a shout-out as well. I think that enough people don't talk about the fact, you know, we like to focus on, oh, Venom, this, that, the Reebok deal. Instagram, in many respects, I don't want to say save the fighters, but it gave you guys that platform, that outlet, that stream that you didn't have in the early days of Reebok when Instagram wasn't as big to where now you could probably make some, I mean, I remember Misha Tate telling me, not Misha Tate, excuse me, I was thinking Misha Tate, she's coming up later, Paige Van Zandt telling me that she makes more on Instagram than in the UFC. I'm assuming if you do it right, you can make a pretty good amount of money on there, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Promote yourself right, you can make a pretty decent amount of money on Instagram or you can get, you know, it's a lot of free things off Instagram. You know, yeah. it's all about social media. I mean, it's very important. And uh, I think a lot of fighters don't understand that the, the roles in fighting is so important every different way that you have to just, you have to cover them off. The more you can cover, the bigger and the better you can become. And you also have to know how to wrestle. And that helps a lot too. Yeah. So, yeah. But you're not, <laughs> ma you're not making more on Instagram than you are in the UFC, right? Like you're, okay. No, I'm not that hot. No, no, no. way. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I make, I make good money in the UFC. I don't know what Paige Van Zandt's uh, money was, but you know, it's like some of these people talking about they don't get paid this much money in the UFC, they don't get paid that much money in the UFC. Either A, they need to fight more, or B, they need to get a better manager. You know what I mean? And it's like, I make good money. I'm very, very happy. My son's happy. My mom's happy. My stepdad's happy. My daddy's happy. My grandma's happy. My whole family's happy. So I don't know what they're complaining about. Okay, so know? this is the other side of the coin. Uh, you know, we we yeah. we spotlight a guy named Jared Cannonier who was talking about not getting paid. I guess the difference might be, and uh, I believe every word that you're saying, you know, what in the past, I don't know, year and uh, two, three months, you have fought seven times. He hasn't. So that could obviously be a factor in all of this, right? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a big difference. And then even when I'm not fighting, you know, it's like, uh, however much the mortgage is on my house and however much the money is that I have to put out every month for, half two bills you know mm -hmm. not the fun stuff half two bills it's covered on sponsorship in it's that's that's the media that we talk about so it's like i'm not really coming out of pocket too many different ways on different things unless i'm just out having a good time i like to have a good time well you see the shoes in the back yeah but you know like yeah i don't understand what people are complaining about you know it's like uh, do your job and you will be more than paid you know okay. um next weekend you mentioned darren till till versus your old pal Derek brunson who wins yeah. 
So I want Teal to win because everybody knows I don't like Derek Brunson. But rumor is, rumor is, right? And I always say rumor because it's not 100% true or it's not 100% yep. wrong. Yep. But if Derek Brunson loses, he retires. And we all know I want all my rematches. So Wait, where is that, you know? where's that rumor coming from? I didn't hear that. You think I, I got people on the great line? I, I he used to sleep with, so you know. What? <laughs> well, why would someone that he used to know know what he wants to do now? Or they're still in hey, men are men. You know what I mean? Oh, stop it! Stop it, Kevin. What are you? Hey. Uh, I mean, he's on quite the roll. You know. Okay, taking your feelings about him aside, who who do you think? Like, do you think he's going to try to wrestle him? Do you think? I, I, I really think I really think that Darren Till wins the fight. I think Darren. I think that I think all these guys that are like right there at the top ten. I think like majority of them are better. They're all better freaking wrestlers than me, defensive wrestlers than me, right? So it's like they stop the takedown. I think that anybody with fluid striking can beat Marvin Vittori. Anybody with fluid striking can beat Derek Brunson. Derek Brunson doesn't take a shot very well at all. You know, not trying to be funny or anything. He's knocks some crazy people out. It's crazy to think that he's knocked those people out, but he doesn't take a shot that well. Um, I mean, you look at our fight. I would hit him with some shot. He would like, you know, he just doesn't take a shot that well. So if you could be fluid and avoid the takedown, I think that you could finish the man. Um, and you still have to respect him coming forward because obviously he has power. He's knocked people out. I didn't think it was that bad, though. And then Marvin, on the other hand, you know, I just feel the same way. I just feel like they're they're kind of robotic in the striking department. So if you could be fluid and stop the clinch and stop the grappling, then you will be okay. Um, so I think that Darren Till, he proved in his Kelvin Gastelum fight that he can stop the takedown and he can stop some of the clinch work. I, pr I think he's proved that he's pretty strong at 85. So uh, I, I really honestly think that Darren Till will win. If we're putting my feelings involved, I hope Derek Brunson can somehow manage to, you know, make that baby that I posted on Instagram and get the job done because uh, I would love one day to get that match back. And, and so, I think that if he wins this fight, I can still pass him up in rankings and get a title fight for him. <laughs> you know? Because of your popularity, because people are really... I mean, yeah, I'm more likable than him, even though he posts his memes these days. That's awesome. And at the end of the day, it's just... Izzy wants new people to fight. So if I can go win four or five fights before, you know, these guys like to take vacations, I can be right back in there. Well, why so. so much animosity towards Mr. Brunson? Everybody. <laughs> it's all of them. It's okay. really all of them. Really? I, I like Derek. Well, I like Robert Whitaker. And I think Jared Kinnear is pretty cool. And I think Kelvin Gosselin is pretty cool. Everybody else, two middle fingers and thumbs out to the side. You know what I mean? W what did you think of Izzy's? Okay, I asked you about Marvin, but Izzy's performance against Marvin. What did you think of that? I, I thought it was great. I thought he did a I think he does a really good job of using his footwork when he has to and uh his ability to stop the takedown as well. He gave up his back and I was like, Oh crap, Marvin's about to get the job done. That was wild. And then he finished up. So yeah, he did I think he did a I think he did a really good job. I don't like that man either, but I think he did a really, really good job. I think, you know, I was like, dang, maybe I should have watched the video of him and Marvin in the first fight before I fought Marvin. You know what I mean? So he did a really good job. I'm no hater. He did a really good job. Why don't you like you know? Izzy? I mean, he's so likable. He's so popular. He's so entertaining. Yeah, I think, you know, he's likable. He's entertaining. The hallway incident, and then when he was at the fight, making those little noises when the guy kicked me in the head. Bro, he just plays too much. So okay. I'm just, yeah. I don't know. You know, hey, it's competition. I like competition. In order to like comp this type of competition, you got to have a little something about him, right? And so... Who do you, you think know, wins? I got that. Izzy Whitaker. Izzy Whitaker. Dude, I don't know, man. It's like Whitaker's really, really good. But once again, man, I think only way Izzy loses is if you can just manage to really, really pull it off at 85. And I don't think very many people have that attribute or when he's at 205 because I think now he's fighting people that's, you know, bigger, stronger, you know, maybe not faster, but got that explosiveness and stuff like that. He's fighting more of a, a harder puzzle to solve at 205 because of the frames versus at 85. The man's tall, kind of a thick guy. You know what I mean? People think he's skinny, but he's not that skinny. Right. So, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, it's like, I think he does really, really good work at 85. At 205, it's a little bit more of a puzzle. And here's the big one, Kevin, and then I'll let you go. The big one. All right. Jake Paul, Tyron Woodley, who wins? Oh, come on, man. Uh, Iron Willie's been doing work with, with Floyd, so maybe he looks a little bit more fluid with the, the boxing. But, man, if people don't, if you haven't really done real boxing rounds and you haven't went in there with boxers that really don't care about who you are, it's different. It's just different. It's different. Those body shots, everybody's talking about, oh, I get kicked and I get hit with knees and elbows. It's different. The way they punch.
just different. And everybody thinks that those Paul brothers aren't boxers. They're putting in the work. Mm -hmm. Those boys can box. So, you know, if you can't box yourself, you need to stop trying to represent MMA. I think the wrestlers need to stick to doing what they do, and the strikers need to go do what we need Mm -hmm. to do to make So you're saying, basically, it sounds like you're leaning towards Jake. Am I wrong? Yeah, I think I think Jake gets it done. I think you know what you want to see a good you want to see a good MMA person go over there and fight Jake. You send Darren Till. You send somebody like Darren Till over there to fight somebody like Jake. You got two good names and Darren Till clean his clock. Yeah, hands down. Interesting. Yeah, and and similar size, right? I mean, Darren Till, one eighty five, or he's a big boy. That Jake Paul. You gonna watch on Sunday? What that fight? Yeah. I mean, if I can find somewhere to scam it on YouTube, yeah, Stop I will. Stop it. What are you talking about, Kevin? What are you crazy? <laughs> I'm going to be in there, Kevin. I'm going to be doing the post-fight interviews. What? Yeah, you know that. I'm going to be gonna the, it? I'm gonna be there. I thought you'd support. I'm you know what? Be- well, I'll tell you what. Ariel, if one of my boys are doing it and one of my boys are having it at their house, I'll give them $5 in support of Ariel. My but, man. My man. You know, to support you. I respect that. Thank you. And, and by the way, I want to let everyone know, uh, my nephew, massive, like this guy, Darren. Uh, Darren Solomon is his name. I'll give him a shout out. Massive, massive fan of yours. Loves you. Anytime I see him, any or at any function, what's next for Kevin? What's next for Kevin? What's and he graduated uh, this past summer, and uh, you sent him a nice video, and that made him the coolest kid in his class. So he was over the moon, and I saw him when he watched it. His friend called me on Facetime. So thank you for doing that. It meant a lot. Oh, no problem, no problem. And if you guys are ever in Texas and want to go shoe shopping, you let me know. I'm All right. Mad for that. All right, Kevin, great to see you. All the best. Congrats on the new deal, and uh, good luck October 2nd against Kyle Dacus. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. All right, all the best. There he is. And say hello to your grandfather as well, from me to him. Uh, I I got you. All right, cool. There he is, (laughs) the one and only Kevin Holland, uh, kind enough to join us. Kevin Holland, kind enough to join us here on the program. Uh, Love talking to Kevin Holland, one of the great characters in the sport. Uh, we uh, spoke to Tyron Woodley, speaking of the, and we're about to have AJ McKee on, who's going to be a part of the uh, Showtime broadcast this uh, Sunday. We spoke to Tyron Woodley about the the tattoo thing, the bet, right? Um, Jake Paul giving, you know, putting down the, the, the challenge. If he wins, Woodley has to get I Love Jake Paul tattooed on any part of his body. If Woodley wins, Jake Paul has to get the tattoo. Well, uh, I was told that a very famous tattoo artist named Tattoo Baby, I will be honest, Mia Culpa, she has a lot of Instagram followers. I am not big into the tattoo scene. In fact, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, Jewish people, if you follow the religion, you actually can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery if you have any kind of tattoo on your body, um, oh, uh, you know, willingly. Um, Anyway, so I'm not really in the scene, although I have a lot of respect for tattoos. I've always wanted to get a sleeve, but again, cemetery can't be buried. Tattoo Baby is going to be there in Cleveland to tattoo the loser on the night. Now, is the loser going to want to get a tattoo in that moment? Remains to be seen, but I did get mock-ups of said tattoos. Uh, Yoon, do we have these uh, mock-ups for the people here? I think uh, we have the, I mean, there they are. I love Tyron. I love Jake. So, you know, if Jake wins, it's, uh, it's you know, that's going on. Tyron, Tyron wins. You, know, you get the point. Uh, I have another one here for you. I guess there's different options. That one's a nice one. Uh, you got the gloves. You got the leaves. Um, I love Tyron. I love Jake. And I believe there's one other version of that as well. Is there a third version? Or maybe, all right, that was it. Um, in any event, could you imagine? Like, could you imagine if she walks into the ring in the moment to tattoo the loser? Again, probably not going to happen in the moment, but these guys know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Got the Barstool guys there. Logan Paul going to be there. AJ McKee going to be there. I mean, it's really going to be a uh, a cast of characters over there in Cleveland. I I think I've only been to Cleveland once. Is that possible? I was in Cleveland for UFC 203. Kind of funny. That was CM Punk's UFC debut and now he's returning AEW, all that stuff, crazy worlds collide five years ago. Uh, that was a great card, and I always said they they need to go back. Like when Stipe Miocic was champion, they needed to go back there, and they didn't, and I think that was a big miss. That crowd, that noise that they made when Stipe beat Alistair Overeem back in September of 2016 was among the loudest crowds that I had ever heard 
up until that point or up until this point. It was known as a Quicken Loans Arena back then. I think now it's the Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. And this would be um, one of the biggest fights to ever happen, one of the biggest combat sports events to ever happen in Cleveland. They don't get a ton. Muhammad Ali uh, once fought there back in the mid-70s, um, but they don't get a ton. So I'm looking forward to it, and I'm very much looking forward to talking to our next guest. He has been one of the stars of the summer. He is the new reigning, defending Bellator featherweight champion. He is on the come up. Dare I say he has already arrived. He just finished one of the pound-for-pound pound best in the sport, Patricio Pitbull, He's still undefeated. He's the son of a legend. He's about to get paid, and he's going to be my broadcast partner on Sunday. He's the mercenary himself, the great A.J. McKee, kind enough to join us. A.J., my man, how are you? And we got Antonio in the house, too. We got Senior up in this, too. What's going on, guys? What up, up, Ariel? How you doing? It's It's a pleasure. uh, It's it's going very well. Um, I'm very happy to have you on. Great to see you. Congrats on everything. And I'm really pumped when I found out you're going to be on the broadcast on Sunday. That's freaking awesome. Congrats, man. I I can't wait, man. It's going to be fun. Um, I'm excited, you know. It's, it's going to be fun, you know, especially just stepping into the boxing world a little bit. And you got Tyron Woodley and YouTube sensation Jake Paul. Like, it's, it's, it's just it's going to be a great show. How do you feel about all of this? You know, it's a very polarizing topic, right? You know, the Paul brothers coming over. Do you give them respect? Do you feel like they're putting in the time? Do you feel like they're legit? If you could take off the Showtime hat for a second and just give me your raw thoughts on it, how do you feel? Well, having Anthony Pretty Boy train with him, and, Ant, you know, Ant's always kind of trained with us a little bit. He's been with Jake Paul the entire time, and he, he said it himself. He was like, he's like, dude, the person he was when we first sparred to the person he is now um, he's he's changing. He wants it. He's hungry. But then again, you still got Tyron Wood, the ex UFC champ, so forth, knockout artist, who's also just a straight hitter. I'm I'm excited for it. You know, um, I think it's bringing a lot of attention to the boxing world. It's bringing a lot of attention to the MMA world as well. Just having where boxing kind of left off and then now set where MMA is kind of taking over, and then just being able to combine both the worlds with with both aspects of the athletes, man. It, it's awesome. I'm looking forward to doing it myself soon. Like, I, I can't wait. You want to do this as well? You want to cross over? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I've, I've been saying I want to fight Floyd for a while, but Floyd said he doesn't fight anymore. I'm like, all right, that's cool with me. Like, I don't, I don't think of it as a fight. You know what I mean? I'm just, I think me being the best at my sport, him being the best at his sport, being able to share that moment with another great that's also undefeated, um, that that's kind of the the sensation that I fixed my mind on is being able to share that that moment. You know what I mean? But how many people can say they sparred with Floyd? Yeah, like to be able to say that it's it's an honor. You know what I mean? And uh, I don't know. May, maybe I'll step into some boxing, go out there, get a little get a little tango and like mango on one day. We'll I love see. it. Okay, <laughs> you, is is that something that's like on your mind right now or is that something kind of down the line i mean you're still so young but is that something you're thinking about right now it's kind of on my mind at the moment um i'm sitting down with bellator obviously we're 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 seeing what's going to happen what we're doing so uh while we figure things out i figure i might as well go do some boxing you know get my feet wet over there Okay, so explain to me the situation, AJ, because we have so much to talk about. You're one of the hottest commodities in this sport. You're 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 a rising superstar. You're undefeated. You're now the new champ. You just you you just finished Pitbull, which was supremely impressive. He's such a great fighter. What is your status? Are you a free? Because I I see you talking about the contract a lot. What is what is going on here? What is your status? Let's talk business here, AJ. I'm a, you got the best hype man in the game right over there. You're, you're uh, behind you, but I'm gonna hype you up too. What's your status right now? How are we getting paid? Um, championship clause. I owe three fights. Um, but were you a free four. agent? Go like if that fight doesn't go your way in July, was that your last fight? And did the championship yeah, clause I, kick in? I, I would. Yeah, I technically would have been a free agent. Wow. And like next month, but the fact that I beat him, I have championship clause. Yeah. Wow. So was that a good I, thing or a bad thing for you? Because now you're kind of locked in. I'm locked in, but at the same time, I needed the accolades of sure. open pit bull. So for me, I had to take this fight, you know, even it it pretty much diminished me entering the tournament in its entirety. So like I had to beat Pitbull, you know, like that was my goal 
you know, forget the million dollars, forget the paycheck being what I'm going to make after that. Like it was, I need the accolades of beating Patricio at least once. So that, that's kind of why I was like, regardless, I got it. I got to get this done. I signed up for this tournament. Let me get this tournament out of the way. Once that's done, then we can go from there. So the championship clause is three fights. Three fights, correct. Now, what if you're still champ after three fights? Does it just go to another three fights? Oh, that's for my manager to figure out. Okay. All right, all right. Now, before the man, right? <laughs> before the three fights actually play out, are you hoping to be like, yeah, yeah, cool, very nice championship clause? We need to talk now because things have changed. Um, a little bit, yes. That's okay. kind of kind of where we're at. So. But I mean, we, I, I don't want to sit out, sit out too much longer either. That's the other thing. You know what I mean? I'm 26 years old. Um, prime years just came off a knee surgery through the tournament. Like if I'm knocking people out, we need to be running them back. Mm. You know what I mean? I, I'm still in the gym. I went to the gym the same week following the fight. Wow. So it's like, we need to, we need to run them back and get it, get it going. You know, this is what I love to do. Like I, I don't care about the money so much. I just want to fight. But obviously, this is how I take care of my family, his, my father's family, and so forth. So uh, that that's a big key, you know. And he's been in the sport for so long; he knows what they expect. He knows what, you know, what what the sport is. It's, it's I got a bobblehead. I got to send you, Ariel. Yeah, <laughs> you, you know, have one. Bobblehead. You have one. I do. Where is do. it? <laughs> you send it to me. I will put it. A- black market. Okay. Oh, I like that. Uh, I'll put a front and center right here next to all the greats. Uh, are they being receptive to you? Do they want to sit down or are they saying, no, 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 you got a contract. We're going to wait this out. Um, no, they've, 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 they've been willing and open to, uh, renegotiating, um, previous to the Cardwell fight, they were kind of open to it. But like I said, I wanted to get the tournament out the way so I could, I could pretty much just stand my ground, show what I was worth. And, uh, you know, be undefeated, walk through the tournament and let them see who AJ McKee is. <laughs> and so in a perfect world, when do you fight again? Hopefully by the end of the year. Okay. And so you're not saying next perfect. month, but just by December. I mean, MMA for sure. December. I need, I need to be back in there before the year's over. Um, boxing. I don't know. I'm what? doing a lot of shows right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We'll see. Okay, this is very interesting. Now, sticking with MMA for a second, as we're trying to parse through this whole thing, your your defense is impeccable. It's impregnable, AJ. But we're getting <laughs> we're getting something done. Um, is your next fight at one fifty five or one forty five? I would like to go up to fifty five. My father also kind of wants you want to sit fifty five or go. go well, let's up. let's hash it out right now. Let's hash it out, pop. What, what are we feeling? 45. Put at 45 and then go up to 55. He, he says it's going to take me six months to put on the muscle to stay at 55. Interesting. Okay. But if it was up to you, let's go get that second belt or just test the waters at 55. Like, like perfect second world. Belt. So it's the rematch with Pipple, but now for his other title. Yeah. Or I'll fight his brother. But he doesn't have a like, title. Exactly. But he's number one contender. What else makes sense? Well, I think they just announced he's fighting Peter Queeley again in November. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, I said um, we run it back for the 155 belt. That's the biggest fight they could do. That's the only fight that makes sense. Yeah, but uh, people, people don't want he he needs a break. Oh, so you've already thrown this out there? I mean, I bear We go back to 2017. I was throwing it out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, I want both the belts. That's that's my cake and me eating it too. This is what I've said throughout the tournament. So. I, I would like I would like that. I think that should happen. You know, it's the fight everybody wants to see. Um, I'm sure a lot of people think it was a fluke the first time. So let's put the icing on the cake. Do you mind if I ask, like, what do you walk around at? Um, I, the biggest I've ever touched was in 185. Oh snap! Um, that was obviously lifting a lot of weights, eating um, 65, 70. Do you feel like 55 you'll be undersized? Like, is that something you're worried about? He's not a big 55 either. You know, like, the, it's it's the perfect fight for you. Yeah, it's perfect. 155 is, I feel like it's it's the perfect weight class for me. Um, I no longer have a reach advantage. Everyone kind of, everyone kind of has the same reach. Um, 
difference is I'll just be a little faster, a little bit stronger than at 45. So see how that goes. Are they receptive to it? Bellator, do, do, do they like the idea of you guys fighting at 155 for his belt? Um, I don't think so. Just because obviously I have fights. I don't think so. I think because I have three fights left and me being at 155, probably it kind of puts the division on hold, but then at the same time, it lets me defend off at 155 for maybe those two fights and see what's to happen there. I don't know. It's, I think it's, it's a, a great lot. idea. I feel That's like great. it's a big time fight. It's a valid fight. Yes, I know it's not great when you have a guy holding two belts. They, they did it with Ryan Bader very recently. Um, the time is now to strike. I mean, this is there's a great rivalry, and I feel like they should do it if it was up to me. Now, I, I, I'm curious with you. Like, you were talking about him, and people say he's a fluke and all that. My thing is, we saw it with Vittori and Izzy in June. When you get that press conference, and one guy is acting all emotional and getting all worked up, like, I, I always say, okay, it's – not fed a compli, but it looks like one dude is focused. One guy's not getting rattled. One guy's not getting um, all psyched up. The, the opponent's not understanding. And it just felt when I watched that press conference, I was like, "Oh, AJ's got him." It, did you feel the same way? Kind of. Um, I was kind of in his head the whole time, um, and then it was the the disrespect where I was like, "All right, I'm gonna give him a taste of his own medicine a little bit." And uh, he didn't like it so much. But for me, I, it was all shits and giggles. I, I was enjoying it the whole time, just laughing, you know. Um, I don't take the smack talking too serious. It's part of the game, you know. For me, it's it's the entertaining side that the fans like. So I don't mind giving it to him. But, yeah. He felt like you crossed the line. You spoke about his family. Yeah, but he spoke about my family. Right. He said, you're going to ask in front of my dad. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna whoop your ass and your wife and kids. Oh, all of us! I crossed the line. Come on, Ariel. Let's be. Let's be. Right, right. I guess someone would say like, "Oh, your dad is your coach," so it's a little different to say that. But nah. family, family. Right. That's fair. That's fair. Um, I, this is the thing that I was uh, saying after the fight. It's amazing to me because look, there's a lot of new fans and a lot of fans who are just you know getting into the sport now. The last two, three years, you know, ESPN involved, Showtime, etc. And a lot of them, the younger fans, didn't watch your dad when he competed. And so to, for me, someone who did watch your dad, who covered your dad, who's been to his fights, like, I can't believe that this is Antonio McKee's son. This guy's flashy, flipping around all over the place. Your dad never got the respect that he deserved, as I wrote on my Instagram, because his style was grinding. He was kind of workmanlike. And you are the complete opposite style of your dad. How did this happen? Was this a conscious thing, or is that just who you are? And that's it? Or like, were you like, I don't want to do that. I want to be a little bit different. I would say it was a conscious choice of training by my dad. Um, myself, I, I, he just let me be me. You know, he made a style, which is my style, to beat his style. So um, as far as wrestling, yeah, like he, he's got the same style as could be, you know, but different era, different time. So um, a lot of people didn't really respect him for it. Versus now, you know, people respect Khabib, obviously, him being undefeated, his style, just the brawl. My dad made a complete style to beat his style, which was obviously it's a little flashy on the feet, but that has to threaten him to the point to make him rely on his wrestling. And once we get to the ground in the wrestling, I have the jiu-jitsu, I have the striking from the ground as well. So he just kind of – he kind of watched me early on in wrestling, and then he just added little things here and there. Hey, add this. This looks good. Keep this overhook, this underhook, and this position. And, uh, yeah, here we, here we have the new mixed martial artist, the mix of all the <laughs> – Was there any part of you as you were coming up who said, my dad didn't get the respect that he deserved. I'm not going to let that happen to me. I'm almost doing this. Of course you're your own man and you want your own story and identity, but it's almost like putting that respect on the McKee name as well. Like the, people need to recognize, yeah. have you, have you like, is that almost like a chip on your shoulder to not only do it for you and your legacy, but a little bit for his legacy as well. In 2021, we're talking about Antonio McKee. If you're not doing your thing, we're not talking about Antonio McKee, right? Because he's your, he's your dad. And so I feel like almost in a weird way, your success is almost doing like a little bit of a revisionist history on how good he was as a fighter. Do you get what I'm saying? Exactly. Yeah. That well, Rampage actually told my dad many years ago. He was like, "Dude, your your son's gonna be your revenge." 
and uh, oh, just wow. watch. Yeah, just watch him because I mean, as a kid, we'd always go over to Rampage's house. You know, he's got this big fat house and uh, like out by Kodo. So it's like he he lives like he's got that nice fat house. You know, we go hang out with Chuck, Randy, like all Tito. I'm like that. I watch you beat all these guys up. Where's our big house? You know what I mean? Like so. Later on, just kind of getting older and then seeing what the world is and just growing up, you know what I mean? Um, seeing what mixed martial arts is all about. I definitely, I, I had a, a statement to make. Um, and that's why I said, this is just the beginning. Um, being a world champ was, that was just so I could hang my picture on my dad's wall next to his picture. You know what I mean? So I could give my grandkids one day. So, um, that's step one, you know, be a champ. Uh, Father was a great champ for many years, eight, eight, eight years on the team, nine, seven, seven, eight, however long. Yeah. But to do that, you know what I mean? In that era, that time was just unheard of. So, um, yeah, man, when, when it comes to MMA, I'm, I'm definitely cream of the crop, but second generation. And that's where it's like, at the end of the day, the last name and key I feel is so much greater than what it's been viewed. And, that's why when people like when I see people in the comment section going off, talking about, oh, he's gonna get cream. I'm like, you have no idea. Uh, like, uh, I'm gonna come back and comment on your post. <laughs> <laughs> but I it's like I, I chill out a little bit now, you know. I love that so, line from Rampage that your son is going to be your revenge. That is a great line. Um, we've talked in the past about your upbringing and about you know what you did and didn't have and all, what's going on over there. Some kind of commotion. What's happening? Uh, oh, don't stop now. Who's this? Oh, Who's this bro. guy? I can't see. <laughs> there he crazy. is. Pretty boy. Hey, pretty boy. We, hey, we're sitting down tomorrow. Don't think I forgot about you face to face. You better bring it. I see you talking a lot of smack over there. You better bring it. You came after BT already, Sport, my employer. Uh, you already know. You already know. Uh, yeah, BT Sport, we're going to talk for sure. <laughs> you let them know what's up. Uh, we'll talk tomorrow. Um, I, I, by the way, AJ, are you, are you, I know you're working, but is your dad cornering, uh, Anthony Taylor? Yeah, yeah we're cornering Ant, so. You're cornering him too? I guess so, yeah. <laughs> what do yeah, you mean? Yeah. Did you just I'm, find out? I'm, I don't know if I'm, if I'm going to be at the desk or what we're doing, but I'm going to be where I can be. Wait, if, you, I, if I can be in the corner, I'm in the corner. Did you, uh, did you, uh, did you help him train for this fight? No, he was training, like I said, he was training with Jake a lot, um. He came back into the gym probably three, weeks three about two, three weeks ago. Okay. So they putting in a little bit of work. Um, he was there about, yeah, about my final week of camp. And then last couple of weeks he's been there. So uh, I'm excited, man. It's well, they're all saying fine. he's too small. He's a 45 or he's a 55 or what's he doing going up against big Tommy Fury. Ant's doing what Ant does. Talk shit and takes fight. <laughs> Dude, it's never, it's never a dull day with this guy, Ant, bro. I swear, Arrow, never a dull moment. Uh oh, and then you got harasses. That was the commotion you heard. Okay, he was over there falling in a chokehold. Hey, Arrow, you look like you look like Drake, dog. You my new hey. friend. Oh, a champagne poppy. What do you mean? The six yeah. god? Hey, let me just say you're not the first, Antonio. You're not the first to say that. You know, we we, we yeah. have been we have been um confused for each other in the past. People have said that. So I'll take that as a compliment. It's a compliment, right? Of course it's a compliment. Yeah. Wait, so what what is going on with uh with Anthony? Are, people are saying that he's gonna get whooped by Tommy Fury. That's not true, right? Well, you know, we've been in the laboratory working on some secret ninja stuff. Okay. And uh, I think he's got a good shot at it. A good shot. I want to hear a great yeah. shot. I want to hear you talk him up. I want to hear you say that you're going to the sports book to drop, you know, a few of that million dollars that your son just won on your boy. Hey, I don't I've bet. been I contemplating, bet. Ariel. Hey, I've been contemplating going to put a good five racks on it. Oh, my God. I'm going to five racks on it. I got, I got to no you'll, win, you'll win 50 racks. That's my right. Point. My point. You got to have confidence in your guy. Punch, close his eyes, hey, and it lands. Hey, Ariel, <laughs> I, I, guarantee, I guarantee you I'm going to win that fight. I promise you that. Watch. I promise we, you. We promise you that. We heard it right here. I mean, who's he fought? Guys who are 0-26? I mean, he hasn't fought in Bellator. He hasn't fought the cream. He's not training with AJ McKee. He doesn't have Antonio. Who does he have in his corner? Tyson Fury? What's, what's that guy ever done? Who's Tyson? <laughs> Come on. Oh, but, yeah, man. it's 
expecting, man. I'm excited for it. It's going to be a great event. And then, obviously, you got Woodley. Um, you think he wins? I do. Really? I do. I think he wins just because of... Hey, 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 see, look, there he goes for us. I mean, what's going here. on? Jeez, Louise, what's happening over here? He's wrestling him? It's a boxing match. Yeah. We don't need to train with that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think Woodley I think Woodley pulls it out. Um, he's got his mom back in his camp. I saw him down in Miami. She's going everywhere with him. So Mama Woodley ain't nothing to play with. When you got your mama in your corner, making sure your P's and Q's is cooked right, you know what I mean? I think – That'll be all right. But then at the same time, you know, you got Jake Paul. He's a young up-and-comer who hasn't really got his feet wet in any any hand-to-hand combat sport besides boxing. And he's he's on fire for boxing. It's not like he has to worry about Woodley taking him down. But the dangerous part is Woodley's a power puncher. Mm. You know what I mean? So it, we, know, we know Jake has a chin. I mean, he's young. It hasn't really been tested too much. So everyone's got a chin when it first – when it first comes around, you know, but I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I, I got to go with Woodley though, just because I've known him for so long. I've known Woodley since I was probably like five. Seven, no, probably like that. How old was I? Like seven when I met Woodley. Eight, I'm like you, Ariel. I've known everybody for so long. I, I got to be biased in these situations. Yeah, no, for sure. Relationship, but um, when it comes to commentating, obviously, yeah, I, I have to. Set the emotions aside. And... Now, can I tell you one thing, AJ, that annoys me? Like, yeah, I put up this poll after your fight, and I was like, okay, I want to know from the people, who do you think wins? Because it's been a while since we've had champions in Bellator who I think are on the level of the UFC champions, and you're one of those guys. And so I said, AJ McKee, Alexander Volkanovsky, who wins? And I got a lot of people say, this is a crazy question. How dare you? Blah, 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 blah. You're a great freaking matchup. For, uh, Volkanovsky's amazing. But the idea that he's going to steamroll through you just because the USC champion is absolutely ludicrous. When you see this, how do you feel? <laughs> it's cap. Yeah. It's cap. It's all cap, AJ. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think, once again, this is what I've done my entire life. He's spent majority of his life doing other things playing rugby and so forth he's a great champion but this is my sport ariel this is what i do like i'm I'm gonna kill or be killed in that in that cage so uh when it comes to another fighter especially at 145 pounds it's it's not gonna be nice i'm i'm coming out victorious um uh, obviously like i said i've had ortega put me in a triangle when i was 19 wow. up at a ufc Torrance, I got to get that hit back one day. Like, I got a hit list. I, I took care of everybody in our gym. Um, I, you know, everybody in the gym, from Brett Cooper, ev- everybody, anybody you can think of that's been our gym. Like, I had a hit list, and I took them out one by one. So it's like, they, they don't call them a mercenary for no reason. I signed that doc. Like, I, I go for it. You know what I mean? It's kill or be killed. But, uh, yeah, Volkanovski, he's good. He's cool. I don't think he's the best, but, I mean, whatever. Who's the best 145er on the planet right now? Hey, get me? He fucking blow right through that guy. <laughs> Tiny nice. No, no. Guys, no. I watching the styles. What the fuck? It wouldn't even go two rounds. He no. might finish him in the first, first round. round. First what is he going to do? That guy's too fucking small. We're talking range, distance, timing, speed, strength. That's like a fucking truck running into a fucking Volkswagen. Hey, Volkswagens are fast. Oh, well, that wasn't, wasn't the argument. I'm sorry. I get it. I get it. Okay, then, on, and I love that. I love Antonio. Well, okay, on the flip side, I also see, all right, when's he going to – the UFC needs to sign him now. The U, does that annoy you? Like, Bellator's been home for you. They came – you know, like, you were one of Coker's first signings when he came over, right? If not his first signing. Yeah. Do you That's feel the same perfect. way? Oh, I need to go to UFC to, in order to be as famous as I can be. I know your dad has had a contentious past with the brass over there. How do you feel about it? When people say that, um, I it's like I said, the the fighters make the promotion. The promotion doesn't make the fighter. Um, for me, I feel at home with Bellator and the things that I can do, endorsement wise. Like I want to get this undefeated deal. I want to go get a Porsche deal, a Cadillac deal. Same. Obviously, I already have a monster deal. Like I want the Snickers deal. There's big things with companies that <clears throat> I feel haven't really got their feet wet within the mixed martial arts community. So um, me just being what I call myself, the new wave, the new era, a younger John Jones, a better John Jones. um, I 
I feel like I can be the one to bring big endorsements back into the sport, like Nike, Gatorade, just being different, you know, being well-spoken, being able to show them the business side of the world from, from your, your camera view, your angle, not just the fighter's angle, you know what I mean? But being able to do the commentaries, the interviews, and, and being able to be young and articulate and do that on both ends, you know what I mean? I think that's where I'm going to be able to win and be able to bring big endorsements to the table, you know, not just because, okay, they want to mess with Bellator because it's an opportunity to have their logos plastered everywhere. But, hey, this kid actually genuinely messes with our product. And on top of, you know, we want to work with him. So if we're working with him, being the business for everybody, which I think that's just, it's kind of like a home family environment at that, at that point, you know what I mean? And I know you're a big Snickers guy. That would be incredible. If uh, you Everywhere. Can, are we working on that? What's going on? Are we working on that? I don't, last night. Yeah, they're working on it. Okay. Um, yeah, it's kind of reached out. Um, we'll see how things go. Uh, I don't know. Okay. For me, I'm just, I'm being the best I can be in, every day in, day out. You know what I mean? Ariel? Everything else, uh, I feel like will just kind of fall in my lap in due time. You know, other, other than that, I used to get fixated. Like early on in my career, seven, eight, nine, nine and oh, I used to get pissed, Ariel. I'm the best in the world. No one knows it. Da, da, da. No one knows who I am. I used to get mad. My my career's going just like my dad's. I don't get the respect or recognition I deserve. I'm done. Screw fight. I'm going to I'm going to hang out. I'm going to party. Like to where now it's like I have to stay in the gym. You know what I mean? I have to go train regardless. Like, all right, no fight, cool. Let's go train. Mm. Like so I know that no one's catching up. You know what I mean? If I'm light years ahead, well, let's stay ahead so people continue to think they're getting better while I'm getting better. And I think that's uh, that's the biggest progression space that I've been able to kind of put together. Okay, last thing for you, AJ, and then I'll let you go. I was asking this uh, before, and then we got rudely interrupted by the guests over there. Um Traveling. We talked in the past, you had no money, and you're in, like, siblings and everything, and, like, you guys are struggling did you ever allow yourself to dream of this million dollars? This, I'm sure you probably thought of it, but have you already exceeded your own expectations from the young kid who was training with, you know, Rampage and Chuck Liddell? Like, have you already reached the point that you didn't even dream of? Or is there so much more that you dreamed of that you have left to accomplish? No, nah, I got a lot to accomplish. That's why I said this is just the beginning, Ariel. <laughs> See the, the scroll feeds, the houses I look at on my timeline. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm an L.A. kid, so you know these houses out, yes. out in L.A. They're a little fat. That's why I'm like, a million dollars, man, it was a substantial amount of money. It it brought comfort, you know, but I got to break the bank. I got to break the bank. I mean, I got in a multi-million dollar house. I need a multi-million dollar house. I need my 14 or my 15-year-old brother, when he comes to fight, if that's what he wants to do, my three-year-old brother, four-year-old brother, when he fights – he doesn't have to fight at all. Mm. You know what I mean? The kid's four years old. He's doing arm bars already, Ariel. I showed him a heel hook last week. He did the Khabib Gaethje triangle. He sat up. He saw me do it in practice and then tried to do it to me after practice. I said, dude, I scratched my head. I was like, hey, didn't I show you? I was like, you saw me do this leg earlier? He starts laughing. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, wow. All right. Crazy. But, yeah, I'm, I'm looking to change the sport, you know? I, I call myself the Floyd of MMA for a reason not just to be undefeated, not to just be the best in the world. But, man, that $100 million check, you know, that I feel like that's what's going to solidify mixed martial art as a sport. Okay, what is happening now? What is this? What is going on? Oh, my. What is happening? Is this constant? Constant. 26 years I lived with this. Oh, my. Who's, who's the guy getting submitted? This dude. Oh man. Let's get hey, let's give Antonio the last word. Antonio, I'm trying to save the other guy. Antonio, last word to you, Antonio. To senior. To you. Yes. I want to go back. I want to go back to the end of July. I want to go back to the forum. I want to go back to you being in your son's corner when you saw him do what he did to Pitbull. Tell me the emotions after everything that you've been through in your career, in your life, feeling disrespected, the promoters, the 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 the, the people saying that you were boring, all that stuff. What was going through your mind in that moment? Oh, 
I didn't really have emotions. Um, I was proud of them, but we knew this was coming. This ain't nothing new. Like, this kid is something different. Regardless whether I got the respect or not, <clears throat> I live in America. What's, what's different for a black male coming from low-income poverty to being the best fighter or the best wrestler or best at whatever he does and doing it independently? I'm used to that. He's been brought up and trained to beat adversity. That's the way I've had to live my whole life. I grew up in the projects. We know that. So when I don't understand your textbook writing to being successful, don't get upset, but I did it the way I knew how to do it. And so I was able to teach him a better way. And that's, I think, what we need to focus on is him being better than me from the dressing to the fighting to how he conducts himself and even his lifestyle, but have the same uh, morals and integrity that I carry in the streets and I carry it every day on an everyday life. That's important. Mm. So I wasn't really excited about it. I was like, okay, phase one, now let's keep moving. Mm. Phase two, let's keep moving. Phase three, this has been planned. This kid wrote a check to himself when he was nine years old for a million dollars. Wow. My defense, how I was going to get it, Ariel. Yeah, he had no <laughs> idea. That's amazing. We... So this was kind of like prophecy. You know, uh, again, you can't stop God. You may confuse people of not knowing if he's God, Allah, Yahweh, Yeshua. That's different. But the actual creator that gave us life on a daily, you can't stop it. Slow it down. At least you might think you're slowing it down, but it might not be in your time. It's in his time, and we don't know that. So we just try to stay spiritually humble and grounded and, and preach truth and stand behind facts, not fiction. What's going to happen here with this contract? What's going to happen? Is he getting paid? What are, what are we going to do? Well, you know what's right. Let's talk about how black fighters are getting paid in the sport. They're underpaid, straight out. I know the contracts. I've seen them. And they're underpaid. Uh, there's going to be black a lot fighters. Of you think black fighters are getting less than their white counterparts, than the other white fighters, just based off their skin oh. color? Well, it just happens to be a coincidence again. Mm -hmm. uh, we go, go pull up all the paychecks and the stuff, the time, and how these fighters were paid. This is why right now you have Francis Ogano. These guys are not trying to fight. John Jones, they're not trying to fight. Why? They want more money. If a company's making the kind of money that the UFC is making, and you're giving your fighters 10 20% less than that, and it's usually the other way around. Like, there's something wrong. AJ should be able to go fight in the UFC for $5 million if Bellator is only going to give him a million. Mm. Why shouldn't he be able to go and get more money to take care of his family and live a job and do his job, you know? Why would you want to work for someone and know that you can go across the street, there's no harm done, and you can get a better job to take and have a better life? That's what we're in this for. At the end of the day, He's a corporation. The way I look at it, I tell him I don't have the emotions of him being an employee. He's a corporation. I need to do best for the company because our family are the employees. And if he goes out, then all of us suffer. So let's just line this up right. Are they receptive? Well, it's out of my hands now. I couldn't get what I needed across. One, he's my son. Two, I'm his trainer. It seems like a conflict of interest. But when do you know for a black man to go ask another, a Jewish man, to pay his black son money? When has that ever worked? When have they ever wrote a check to another black man for the value of his son? No, I have to let wolves dance with the wolves. Mm. I'm a lion. I can't be in the same place. So what you're trying to say is, correct me if I'm wrong, you're trying to say you had to get management. I think you're represented by CAA now, right? Correct. And they're going to do the negotiations. You're staying out of it. Is that fair? Uh, I don't know if I'm going to stay out of it, but <laughs> I believe CAA works for AJ. Yes. They work for the McKee group. That's right. That's what they work for. They're employed by us to do a job. I want to hold them responsible for the job that they do based on doing what we want it want to be done. Gotcha. That's the right way to look at this. That's why I don't understand why everybody is always heckling me and upset. I'm sorry I didn't go to Harvard and come back with a master's degree in vocabulary. 
I understand the game. I've been here a long time. I've seen the contract. This is an ugly game, Ariel. It's ugly. It's nasty. And you know it. Mm-hmm. And I love my son more than I love life sometimes. And so I want the best for him, just like any other father. So why is it such a problem when I speak so passionate about the sport doing right by my son? By the way, who says it's a problem? I think it's Ooh, great. Man. Who says it's a problem? Wait, your, wait till people go on your thread. Uh, don't, listen, see- don't listen to those people. Don't, I'm, I'm talking about oh. the people who matter. Like the, 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 the brass, I'm sure, doesn't mind. Like that's your son. Of course you're going to speak passionately about him. Right. Right. Well, let's make them them numbers in his bank account right. That's what I'm. That's what I'm talking about. I, that's what I was asking you. Are they going to make it right? What? What? I. I mean, the worst it could be. Look, I, I. I own a promotion too. So the way I look at it is, look, either you make this kid happy, or you make him fight out his three deals and you let him go. USC picks him up. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, <clears throat> that's another mon- a monster that we got to deal with. Yeah. Right. But yeah. the. Di- is I know what he's capable of. You know, here's a real Conor McGregor. It's just he's got to figure out what lane he wants to go in as far as how he wants to be labeled as a fighter. Do you want to be the shit talker? Do you want to be the guy that comes in and take care of the shit talk? Yeah. Well, I say you could be both. Why the heck not? You guys are doing great things. Congratulations to you and your son and your family. And I look forward to seeing you guys out there. I'll be there tomorrow in the CLE to see Anthony Taylor against Tommy Fury as Anthony Taylor attempts to shock the world just like AJ McKee has done time and again. How about that? And it sounds good, like a plan. For the underdogs, we're doing it. We love it. All right, take care, guys. I'll see you out there. Good luck, and thank you for joining us. Likewise. See you soon. All right, there's the McKees right there. How do you not love those guys? They keep it real. I love it. Antonio McKee. A real OG of the fight game. Telling it like it is. They need to do whatever it is that they need to do to keep him around. And it's not like you guys think that like they're just going to come in there. You think they're just going to come in there and say, you know, hey, hey, UFC, take our biggest star. It has been a long time since Bellator had someone, honestly, homegrown, that they built on their own who's generating the kind of buzz, the kind of interest that AJ McKee is generating. They are going to do everything in their power and then some, as they should, to keep them around and to keep them happy. As they should. If it were up to me, and it ain't, I run it back at 155, keep the momentum There's a great story there. It's a rematch. I mean, how often does this happen? Rarely, if ever. And don't tell me you don't want to tie up a division. You did it with Pitbull. You did it with Bader. I mean, you tried to do, you know, like, where are you? You know, all that stuff. Come on. Now's the time. Now's the time to pull the trigger. This man is on fire, and he's a name that we're going to be hearing about for a very long time. That was a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to seeing Anthony Taylor this weekend on Sunday against Tommy Fury. All right, let's move along. Uh, We've got one of the legends of the game coming up next. One of the greatest female fighters of all time. She returned to action after a very long layoff, her first fight since 2016. Looked fantastic in her win over Marion Renault. She's got that mom strength now. She is on top of the game. The word is she's returning in October, but before that, she's going to be a part of the Invicta FC broadcast team this Friday. We're talking about Cupcake, Misha Tate, who's kind enough to join us via the Magic of Scoom. There she is. Misha, how are you? Hey, excellent, Ariel. How's it going? It's going well. Stressful day? What's going on? Mom life, it's tough, right? Yeah, it is. It's tough. We had a few hiccups this morning, but baby's asleep and I got time, so... Here I am. Okay. Sorry for being fashionably late. No problem. No, I get it. As a as a father of three, I get it. It's uh, it's their schedule, not yours. By the way, uh, happy birthday, belated, happy engagement. What a time for you, Misha. You just got engaged, right? Yeah, yeah. We got engaged actually just a couple months ago, but we put this video together and um, it's still released that on my my YouTube channel of the engagement party, and um, which was also a couple weeks ago. But you know. These things take time. So 
I get it. You got a lot going on. on I appreciate it. It feels like it's all coming up Misha Tate at this point. The return, the babies, the birthday, the engagement. I mean, I could just feel it. You're glowing. Like, life is good, right? Life is great. It's very busy. It's a bit chaotic. But truthfully, I don't think I'd have it any other way. Like, I don't think I know how to operate any other way. I like a lot of stuff going on. and And it turns out that that means sometimes it's chaotic. But... I hate being bored, Ariel. Yes. I hate being bored. I'd yeah. rather be a bit overwhelmed and kind of, you know, pushing myself maybe a little bit more than would be a comfortable pace. But um, I just enjoy that that way of life so much more than sitting around and not having anything to do. You know, when the pand and I realized this about myself when the pandemic hit, and I was in Singapore, and I just thought um, there was nothing to do. We were locked down completely. Everything was locked down. No work. Like it was just it sucked. I'm like I gotta I gotta be busy. Busy is better than bored. Well, speaking of being busy, uh, you're working this Friday. You're a part of the Invicta FC broadcast team. What are you going to be doing for them? So I'm going to be commentating the fights. Um, I commentated years ago on one of their first. I would say within the first five shows with Invicta, but you know it's been it's been a long time. I think they just celebrated their ninth year. So. You know, and this will be a step up. This is a pay-per-view event um, featuring two title fights. There's the Bantamweight title on the line and a and a 115-pound title on the line as well. So I'm excited. You know, I've always been a fan of the ladies. So whenever I get the chance to call any action, but especially women who they, they know too. I mean, you, you have to know what's on the docket. If you win an Invicta FC world title, like you're probably going to go to the UFC if that's what you want to do. Right. That is a great point. I want to ask you about that. How do you feel about the current state of Invicta? I know there's a new ownership team now, Anthem Bottom, Shannon's still around. But to me, my problem was a couple of years ago, it felt like Invicta was doing such a great job of building stars. I mean, you look at the people who have fought for Invicta, you name some, you know, like Rose and, and Chris and, and Carla Sparza and all these names. I could go on and on. What's that? Lauren Murphy, too. I mean, she's fighting for a Yes, yes. Now. Oh, I mean... Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could go down a list of of 20 names, but then the problem was they reach a certain level and then they get poached and then they get poached and then they get poached. Do you feel like we have to reach a point where, you know, th- those names stick around, that they become, you know, comfortable in Invictus so that it's not just a feeder league, so to speak, because it's hard to keep up if you're just a feeder league. It's hard to keep up if you're any other league than the yeah. UFC, in my opinion. You know what I mean? I, I, you know, I wouldn't call any other league necessarily. Well, there's, you know, um, LFA and a couple of those that I guess you could consider those feeder leagues. But, you know, Bellator, PFL, everybody's trying to make their own way. And I don't think it's a bad thing to have the UFC on your side. I don't think it's a bad thing to have them kind of, hey, you know, we'll work with you and, um, you know, granted, she's definitely taken her own direction in this, and that's that's Shannon. You know, she's going to lead a charge, and she's for the athletes first and foremost. And when you fight for Invicta, you really get I've, – I've never fought for Invicta, but I've been there. I've seen it when you get the welcome packages. You can tell it's a woman-run a, a run company, a mother, you know, because she – it's like you get bath bombs when you walk in. It's like you get socks and popcorns and all the things from around Kansas. You know, she's just great. Anyways, to answer your question, um, sure, for business, it would probably be better if she could get some of those people to stick around. But I think um, she wouldn't have her own promotion, and she wouldn't have gone out on a limb to do an all-female. If she didn't care about what's best for the fighters. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So if the ultimate goal and dream and desire is to be a UFC world champion, you know, Shannon's the first to say, who am I to say uh, what you can and cannot do? Um, so, I mean, I would like to see maybe the champions have a clause that, you know, if you become a champion, maybe you stick around at least for one defense kind of a thing before you're just gone. Cause I think the quick turnover of belts or one or two defenses and, um, you know, agree to keep them on a scheduled pace. Yeah, there's got to be a little bit, a little bit of give and take, I think. But you know, Shannon's for the fighters first. Something I've always appreciated with her. Mind you, we worked together in Strike Force way back. You know, she's been always the one to go to bat for the fighters, and nothing's changed. And so you are back as well, and you looked so good. What a great win! What a great performance against Marion Renault. Be honest with me, Misha. When you were planning to come back, when you were thinking in its infancy, the embryonic stages of you thinking about coming back, could you have ever dreamed that it would have panned out like that? That you would have looked that good? And and honestly, I mean, 
not only did you perform that good, you looked stronger and fitter. I don't know how you did it as a mother of two now, but like you look like a completely different person out there. Did you ever dream that it would turn out this way in all facets that well for you? Truthfully, I don't think I could have imagined that perfect of a scenario in my head. I mean, I, I had to draw on my former experience. My, my former experience was, you know, this was the kind of shape that I was in, and this was the, the, the kind of – and I knew I wanted to do it better. I didn't want to come back and just be the better version of myself. But when you're talking about the infancy, like those first few thoughts, and when I'm trying to look forward and how long would it take and will I be able to – I mean, I just had my son. It took me a year to get, you know, from that point of having my baby, well, 13 months to getting back into the the best shape I've ever been into. But I don't think I could have imagined it that way. Um, but that's how destiny has a way of, of playing itself out in, in life in general. I think when we listen to the, our calling and we follow it with our whole heart and soul, there is more to be discovered and learned, um, you know, and that the foresight is never as great, you know, as what we can see in, in retrospect. But I'm so glad that I put myself in the position to have that success, you know, that I invested in myself, that I did all the things right. And it paid off in a huge way. I'm so happy to have that, that, that come back. And, you know, I said I wanted to do it, but saying it and doing it are two different things. Um, doing it in front of essentially no fans as opposed to doing it in front of fans. Was that, was that kind of weird or a bummer or was it actually a blessing? Because I'm sure there were some butterflies, some nerves, and now it's like, all right, it's just another day at the gym. It's not 18,000 at T-Mobile arena. How did you feel about that? Gosh, it had been so long since I had fought at all. Like it's almost like, it just felt like being at home. I didn't really distinguish that there was such a huge difference. You know, I had a few of my teammates there who were fellow UFC fighters, right? Uh, you know, you get to go if you're a Las Vegas local. And, you, and then I had uh, my parents were there. And that was it, my manager. You know, so I had some cheers in the crowd, and that was enough. Like, I, I really felt like there was nothing that was going to deter me from winning that fight whether there was no audience or there was an audience I had just prepared for that we've been in a pandemic for so long that I knew what I was getting myself into right I knew that there wasn't going to be any fans and no it was it was cool I I I didn't care that I wasn't on a pay-per-view I didn't care that I wasn't the main event I didn't care that it wasn't I just wanted to go back and prove it to everybody that you know I was serious and that I'm gonna make this comeback and I'm gonna make a title run and I'm gonna shock the world again did you feel like your purpose, your feeling on Saturday morning, in your heart, what was going through your mind, did you feel any different because you're fighting for other people now too? You're not just fighting for yourself and maybe your partner, you're fighting for your kids as well. You're representing them. You're a mom now. That's a whole different ball game. Did you feel any different as far as what you were thinking about, what you were feeling in those final moments before the fight? I felt so much more relaxed and at peace knowing that whatever the outcome was that I still have the uh, stability in my life that my kids will be there. My partner will be there. My parents will be there. My family will be there. My friends. And I truly believe that has made me so much more dangerous because I used to fear losing in a way that was unhealthy. That would take away a little bit of my, you know, risk, even though, you think about that, and you might look and you might not say, like, oh, in her career, you know, she took a lot of risks or whatever. Yeah, I mean, when I really needed to, I, I did, but I, I was always so afraid of if I lost, that's what I was. I was a loser. That was my identity. Now I have a complete identity outside of just being a fighter. So I come back for the first time in my life if fighting only because it's my desire, it's my passion. It's what I truly want to do. I'm doing this for the first time for myself, for nobody else, with no extra outside influence in a negative way, in a positive way. It's just about me and where my mindset is. And um, I just think it makes me that much more dangerous because, truthfully, I can go out there and, and throw all caution to the wind. Like, if I, if I lose, God forbid, you know? If I lose, I still get to go home and kiss my kids and have a great life. Like, I, my life is awesome. So all I can do is put 100% in there. 
And that's what I'm going to do every single time. I have no fear of losing. No fear. So I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to kick ass and I'm going to win, right? I think when you take away that, it adds to the other side, which is like going to benefit me towards winning when you don't fear losing. As you know, uh, MMA media, a little bit crazy. We can get a little crazy. And uh, you made these comments on your radio show on Sirius at the 98% and all this stuff about the pay. And it kind of spread like wildfire. And then you felt the need to clarify your stance and that you're very happy and you're not complaining and all this stuff. What do you want to say about all of that? Do you want to clear the air here? It's a different platform. We're, 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 you were trying to make the point that there's just a lot that goes into this. It's not, hey, you get money and then you go to the bank. There's taxes. There's managers. There's coaches. I'm assuming that's what you were trying to say, but it felt almost, at least to me, like it was a bit uh, annoying to you that it was being taken in a different context or maybe misconstrued. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to maybe clear the air if you want it. Oh, absolutely. I, no, I really appreciate that. Um, what I was trying to say is that it's not all, like you said, just money that gets to go in the bank. There is, you know, 60 to 70 percent. I close, I spend it closer to 70 percent of my check on, right? It'll go to taxes, it'll go to coaches, it'll go to all these different things. I'm okay with that because that's me investing in myself. I'm not going to complain that I'm in a 37 percent tax bracket. That means I'm making a lot of money. You know what I mean? Having to pay taxes is a good thing. Um, and also paying my coaches. You know, I have more coaches. I have more people who understand what's going on in the game. And, hey, you know what? It's all right. Like, I'm down to spend the money on myself. I spend uh, all organic, grass-fed. If it doesn't run, fly, swim, or come straight out of the ground, I didn't eat it. My diet was very expensive. My food prep, all these things. And to be fair, a lot of them were first-time purchases that that will benefit me because I haven't bought it in five years. You know, like you invest in new running shoes, you invest in a new bike, you invest in a new uh, polar heart rate monitor, whatever, like these kinds of things. Like my camp was very expensive, but the results were great. And I'm going to continue on that trend. I would spend, Ariel, I would spend every last penny to touch that belt again. I'll spend it all. You know what I mean? I'm not complaining about what the UFC pays me. UFC paid me $200,000. I mean, I wouldn't get that anywhere else, I don't think. So, look, I got $200,000 to spend in my camp. I reinvested it in myself, almost all of it. I don't think that was a bad – I don't. it wasn't a bad choice. You know, I'm not broke. I own my house free and clear. I own my cars free and clear. Like, I have a great life. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I know I'll make hand over fist when I'm a champion again. That's the, that's the ultimate goal. So. You know, some some fighters don't spend that much money. You know, there's some fighters out there who who cut corners. Um, you know, I think um, I think Nick Strickland, if I heard this right, that he does not pay his, pay coaches or a corner. So he but he tells them that up front, like, hey, I, I don't need you. Maybe he doesn't need you. You know, I feel like I do. So um, maybe some fighters don't spend that much. Maybe some fighters. Uh, you know, cut corners in their training. Maybe they just don't have that all-in mindset. Mine is an all-in mindset right now. Um, I'm not here to play games. You know, I'm not here to take part. I want to hmm. do everything I can to be the world champion again. I want to take this this division by the horns. And um, I will. I will continue to reinvest myself. And I just don't think people need to worry so much about, like, how I'm spending my money. <laughs> I appreciate the genuine concern, but some people are like, oh, you should well, you know, if I want to spend 98% of my fight check, that's, that's on me. You know what I mean? If I want to do that for my fight camps and spend it on myself, then, then I will. At least I have the money to spend. I'll just add quickly two things. I think uh, if I were in charge, I hope you don't mind me saying that, you deserve a hell of a lot more than 200000 I would pay you more than 200000 if I were a promoter running a promotion. I just want you to know that. And number two, you said the right thing there, genuine concern. I think most of the people aren't trying to tell you what to do. I think they're trying to say, you're a legend, you're Misha Tate, you're a former champ, we think you should get more than 200. So it seems to me like it's coming from a place of being a fan of yours as opposed to a place of being critical of you. If you, At least that was my right. read on the situation, not people trying to make you feel bad, but just being like right. almost mad on your behalf. Sure, and I, and I get that too. You know, some people were calling bullshit that I didn't spend that much. Ah, I mean, I'm not gonna, you know, I guess yeah. it's like bank statements. I don't, I don't, I don't care. I didn't make the statement to like make people feel sorry. I just want people to know how serious I am, like how serious I am in investing in myself and that I'm gonna spend 
whatever it takes to be a world champion again. So that's really, that's really where it is. Um, I mean, it's public information. Uh, most places what we got paid, like my pay was already released. So I didn't feel like it was a secret. Um, you know, plus I got the $50,000 bonus. I was really happy about that. Um, and then well, I think we got another 11000 from, I don't know if it's Reebok or if it's Venom now, to be Venom. honest, it's confusing me. Yeah. Probably Venom, I think. Yes, yeah. it is Venom. <laughs> and, yes, it is Venom. Uh, you know, so, yeah, it's, it, all, all in the end of the day, I walk away with some, and I'll walk away with a lot when I'm holding the belt again. And so it seems like, uh, and I don't want to get you in trouble here, but the reports are out there. It's you versus Caitlin Vieira, October 16th. Is that accurate? So we're really close. We're okay. really close, but you know, I mean, I don't get excited until things are the 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 dotted line is signed and the contracts are out and and it's you know it's official official. But I mean, um, yeah, we're looking in October. It's looking like Ketlin, but I don't have communications on her side, so I don't I don't know yet. That's fair. Um, that's fair. I'm not trying to get, yeah, get you in yeah. trouble or anything. All I'll say is I was after the fight. You know, we play matchmaker fantasy. And I was like, oh, this seems like a great time for Misha versus Holly too. Was that ever under consideration or am I totally off? Did you have a different, like maybe it was Vieira who you thought made most sense next and that's what you got. Um, it, it wasn't Holly for the reason that, uh, I feel like that's a, that's like a golden egg fight. That's mm -hmm. like a fight that we could do at any, any time, any point, it'll never die. It's like, you know, Diaz Connor three. It's like, it's always kind of available and there. So I wanted my next, fight to be a proper climb in you know in the rankings like I don't want to come in and insult the division I don't want to come in and say like oh I should be fighting the top one or two and you know Holly she's ranked number two it is a fight I want at some point because I know I can do it better personally I wanted the winner of Ketlin Vieira and Sarah McMahon but with Sarah getting injured and, and out of that um you know obviously Ketlin is is left without you know holly has a fight already um and yeah i think everyone else is either injured fighting or pregnant or just had a baby <laughs> so, so yeah honestly it's kind of a crazy time in the division right now but but petlin sounds like a, a very fine opponent somebody i haven't got to fight yet kind of fresh blood in the ufc and i'm excited for you know that potential matchup you beat fiera is it title shot next? I mean, I, I don't imagine it's that many fights. What do you think? Well, I think, so I'm ranked eighth. I think Catlin's ranked seventh. Obviously, really heavily depends on the performance, right? I mean, it, it, right? You go out there and you get a real, uh, a great finish over a woman who is, um, yeah, I would say she's a very tough fight, tough to beat. But, um, it, you know, but if it's not, if it's a little bit more competitive, Either way, I still feel like one more fight probably before because I'm not – I don't want to waste time, but I'm also not in a rush. Everything will be when it's meant to be at the time that it's meant to be. So, look, if it's like, you know, an Aspen or I guess potentially Holly. Look, I'm not against the Holly fight, but I, in my mind, the way that I have this played out that I really want it to be is that I win the title and then Holly fights me for the mm -hmm. title. That would be like my my perfect storm, my perfect scenario. Um, but, you know, either way, before this is all said and done, Holly and I will fight each other. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not dodging her. She's, you know, she's great and everything. Like, I appreciate her, but uh, I, I think time and place is very important so right now that's not the fight we're looking for um but you know we'll get we'll get there eventually hopefully when i'm the champion she'll be able to challenge me for the belt uh two last quick things and then i'll let you go uh, i know you do a lot of your training in las vegas i saw you with dj that was really cool did you also go to colorado with trevor whitman i did for my last camp i did part of the expenses there right, you go <laughs> right, right, right. was that a first for you yeah yeah i made the trip um it was the first time out there in Colorado working with Trevor. However, uh, when he was out here coaching on the Ultimate Fighter, I did dabble a little bit with him there, and I thought he really blew my mind. And he was somebody that left a big impression about um, thinking outside the box. There's a lot of coaches in this game who kind of reiterate a lot of the same things. Trevor's not one of those coaches. He's one of them that really thinks outside the box, and I think what he's been able to do, taking – Justin Gaethje, who was a pure 
rest, savage wrestler, really good wrestler. And and now in the UFC, what is he known for? He's not known for his wrestling. Right. He's known for his striking, right? And he hangs with the best, and a lot of times beats the best strikers. Not even his background. So, and then you got you, you know you've got Rose who from the ground you know from the ground up working again with Trevor has just made this these incredible leaps and jumps and transformations with her. So, um, however much time I can get in with the genius like that, absolutely. So yeah, I did I did go out there and get to play a little bit hands on. By the way, after you won in uh, July, you hear from anyone that surprised you, that was happy for you, anyone that kind of came out of the woodwork and sent you a message and said, yeah, con- you know, congrats, welcome back, Any- anything that, you know, you weren't oh. really expecting? Gosh, I can't even think past yesterday, I swear. Yeah. Like when I go back and say, you got to give me a heads up on this kind of question. I okay. do some recon, some research. <laughs> but, um, no, I mean, like literally, every, I mean, honestly, everybody, like, so many people reached out to me to support, which was, you know, it was, it was kind of surprising. Like even the fan response, like I wasn't really sure what to expect. Usually social media is a pretty mean place, you know, it, it can be hard. Um, but no, I think everyone really had a pretty positive response. And I think I hold the record now in the UFC for having the longest time between fights, like the longest layoff, 1,709 days. Wow. But I came back mom strong feeling better than I've ever felt and I'm excited to continue the wave. So um, if this is the next fight, then hopefully, you know, we get to, hopefully that'll happen. And hopefully, I don't want to say hopefully, you know, I'm going to go out there and, and do my best and look better than ever. Well, I know a lot of people, some people made some good money on me. I did some signings recently and they were like, I made money on you. And I was like, I'm at least somebody, at least some people listen. Some people really were not sure what to think. And I was just, I knew, like, I was just so determined to win that comeback fight. Um, so anyways, if you bet on me, thank you. And I'm, and you're welcome. <laughs> well, it's one of the best stories of the year. Uh, genuinely was, was so great to see you back smiling, happy. It was a shame that it had to be Marion's uh, retirement fight, but I thought that she uh, handled it with a lot of grace and class. You are an OG of this game, a trailblazer, a pioneer, and you deserve all those accolades. As you said, social media can be a pretty nasty place at times, but it was it was really wonderful to see the uh, the reception that you got and how happy people were for you. So great to have you back in the mix. Great to have you back as a mom now, representing all the moms out there. You're an inspiration to all the moms out there. And I look forward, if it is October 16th, I look forward to you being back. But before then, I do look forward to being on pay-per-view this Friday. You can watch it on Fight.tv at 10 p.m. Eastern. That's the main card, Invicta FC 44, A New Era, and then the prelims before the pay-per-view on Access TV in the U.S. and on Invicta's YouTube channel worldwide. Misha Tate will be calling the action as an analyst. Misha, always great to talk to you. Welcome back, and good luck on Friday. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ariel. All right, there she is, Misha Tate, joining us. She'll be a part of the broadcast team uh, this Friday with our good friends over at Fight.TV. Vacant Invicta FC strawweight title on the line. Emily Ducote against Danielle Taylor. Taylor, of course, holds wins over the likes of Jessica Aguilar, Jessica Penne, and C. He Ham. And there's an Invicta FC uh, bantamweight title on the line as well, vacant. And so they're in this new era, new ownership, anthem. And, it, you know, I always used to compare Invicta to sort of the Montreal Expos, my favorite baseball team, who would build talent up only to see them go to the Yankees, to the Mets, to the Dodgers, etc. Although we did get Pedro Martinez from the Dodgers, but alas, I digress. And they reminded me of them. They would build great talent. They would sign great names. They would, they would, they would, they would give them the proper fights. I mean, the lit, I mean, name a female fighter. She probably fought for them and did great things for them. And then they would go away. I mean, there was that one season of the ultimate fighter where it was uh, Rose and Carlos Barza in the finals. The one with, uh, with, uh, no, that wasn't the one with, um, with Ronda and Misha, it was the one with Gilbert Melendez, I believe, and Anthony Pettis. Yes, that's right. Um, and like the whole season was UFC, you know, was was taken by the UFC from Invicta, and they were okay with that arrangement. But I think in order to get back on track, build some buzz, build some momentum, build an identity, you got to start keeping some of those uh, fighters under contract, and you know, maybe think outside the box. May you know, 
what I've suggested. Sign Frank Mir's daughter. You got to find the fighters that are moving the needle. Amanda Serrano, who's fighting on this uh, Showtime card on Sunday, who dabbles in MMA. You got to find those names that move the needle while also building up your own talent. And uh, and then, you know, Invicta's a name. And they deserve to be here. And they are, without a doubt, it's not even close, the preeminent uh, all-female organization in the sport of MMA. I'm happy they have new ownership, good people over there, fellow Canadians, by the way. And uh, I am looking forward to the return on Friday. It's a busy weekend, a busy week for MMA. Speaking of another fighter who fought for Invicta, who is very proud of her time in Invicta, who's one of the OGs of the game, one of the, the, the up and, I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, she's a rising star. She's still a star. She is a legend. She is a pioneer. She's all that and more. You can throw any accolade her way. She's the one and only Chris Cyborg, our final guest of the day, kind enough to join us via the magic of Zoom. And she is in Colombia, I do believe, right now. Right, Chris? Oh, I don't hear you. Are you muted? Oh, are you muted? Yes. Okay. No, I'm good. Now you're Hi. back. Hi, Ariel. How are you? Hello, Chris. How are you? What, do you, what are you doing yes. over there in Colombia? Uh, I'm in Colombia. I'm doing the treatments again, bioaccelerate and put stem cells in. And whole body again, you know, the fourth time I come here. And it's my, it's my family, by accelerate. Yes, uh, a lot of fighters are going over there doing this stuff. And, and so you feel like this really helps you. It keeps you rejuvenated. It keeps you healthy. People glow about this treatment. They say it's, uh, it's, it's, it's life-changing, career-altering. Same for you? Yeah, same for me. You know, I mean, really, I, I don't have bad, bad injuries in all my career. You know, I'm very blessed about this. But, you know, the little injuries I had in the long my career, Man, I'm not having any problem. You know, I feel great. I feel, you know, I feel can fight more than 10 years. Wow. You know, this is a strategy. This is a strategy. It's fourth time coming in. Do you want to fight for another 10 years? Yeah, maybe. If I feel great, you know, I don't know. If I feel my heart, God telling me, I know, Chris, it's time to break. I will, but I, I, I love to fight. It's my job. I use my, my fight for chair, my experience, you know, help the community, you know. I want to do more. Okay. Uh, and Chris, before we continue with the interview, I, I did want to send my condolences to you, uh, your longtime coach, Saul Solis. We found out he passed yes. away. I'm very, very sorry. A legend of the fight game, coach to many, many great stars and champions like yourself. So I was very sorry to hear that. And, and I wanted to send my condolences to you, his family, to anyone who's known him and worked with him in the past. I know, very sad. I know Saul is a beautiful heart. You know, I have the opportunity to do a lot of camps with him. And just to say for my condolences for all the families too and all the support for them. Amen. Um, Chris, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on was last week, as you know, Kayla Harrison was successful. And you popped up on Twitter after her win and said, hey, let's go, Super Fight 155, this and that. She was like, oh, yeah, of course you can make 155, all this stuff. And she only has one fight left on her PFL deal. Is this something that you want? What a fight it would be. Kayla Harrison versus Chris Cyborg. Is this something that you want? Is this something that you are going to try to actively get her to come to Bellator to fight you in this super fight? No, I think it's going to be a great fight for me. You know, she don't need to come in for 145. We can fight 155. And, and then, you know, she said the last fight in her contract, too, I saw. And I, be, I believe maybe she's can sign with the UFC, but she's made more money than Amanda Nunes in PFL. You know, I don't know how it's going to be works, but maybe we can do one fight champion versus champion. And Scott Coker can be my co-promoter. And, and maybe, you know, in the future. And it's a great fight, you know. she's People say, ah, she's going to take you down you know i believe in the fight wrestling can beat judo and if she's maybe can be taken down yes but they can take down her too and there's an mma fight you know the, the only i think she's can worry about the strike because if you see her cup fights with that 10 or what 11 0 um the girls fight her like scary to get a take down and scary to punch for take down and we really when you fight on judo girl you can think about maybe you're gonna get a take down yes mm -hmm. it's an mma fight but you cannot be afraid to get a take down so, and she's afraid to strike too when she's fighting the girls, you know. And the example is when she's fighting Cindy Dandois. Cindy Dandois came from judo. So, 
Is she really confident in her strike? Is she supposed to use the strike for fights in the doors, you know? But she's no confident. She's she's just did do the takedown and I don't know, but it's gonna be a great fight for, for both, I believe. Interesting. Okay, so I said last week that I think she is already, despite maybe the uh the lack of talent that she has faced, I think she's a top ten pound for pound fighter right now. A lot of people said I was crazy. It's too soon. How can you say that? She hasn't fought anyone of note. What does Chris, who is a top two pound for pound fighter, what do you think of that statement? You know, she is, she's she's repeat fighting a lot of girls. Like she fight one Brazil, I think maybe three times. And I respect all the girls. You know, I'm not here for saying you no. Know, she's not fight top ten. I respect everyone. Uh, but you know, we don't need to talk about me or Amanda Nunes. You can talk about she's if she's maybe go to FC fight GDR is going to be a hard fight for her. Then they're going to expose her 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 weakness. If you fight Holly Holm to Julia, but you know, I think you have a lot of girls can can show expose her her weakness. So would it be fair to say you think she's a bit overhyped? You know, I hear she's talk. I hear how she is. If you, she's very young, I don't know if she you knows the history of MMA. She's just reminded, you know, that another judo girl come to MMA. And I just look for, you know, what's going to happen. So it's, it's nice. It's okay. It's nice when people really think you more than you are because, man, it, 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 it's, it, it's hard. It's hard. But, and I do only think too, I don't like to talk uh, about myself. I'm different. I, I prefer the fans, the fans, the people see who I think I am. But, you know, Lady, she does what she thinks she's doing the right thing. Uh, I think you were referring to Ronda Rousey. You never got that fight. This could be the judo fighter that you do get to fight, right? That would be uh, a nice way to, to round things out because you never got that Ronda fight. Yeah, the Ronda fight never happened. I really trained you know, some judo for training for her. And the, the first thing you learn is, okay, I supposed to fight Ronda Rousey before, and I was training for her camp. First thing you train in judo, it's learn to fall. Mm. So because you know when you're going to fight judo, maybe you're going to fall, yes, but you have to know what to do after. So, and I believe Ronda Rousey was more dangerous than Kayla. You no, know, she is, she is, her transition is fast, technical is fast. I know she get a gold medal in the Olympics, but I think it's different level about the speed, about the, the transition for the submission, and yes. Two gold medals, by the way, not just one, two gold medals. Yes, yes. Impressive, no? Yeah, it's nice. Congratulations <laughs> for her. It's good match. She's represented very well in the United States. Oh, my gosh. I would love so much to see that fight, Chris. You versus Kayla Harrison would be one of the biggest fights that women's MMA could put on right now. We have to figure this out. Have you talked to Bellator about this, that you want this? Have they told you they're going to try to go after her? Did I lose you, Chris? Uh, do, no, no, I'm here. Okay, you okay. Me? Yeah, I hear you. Yes, yes. Yeah, you know, my next fight is going to be MMA. Uh, I really tired to waiting for the one boxing fight. I really would like to do this year. And I'm waiting all the other all the, all the, you know, moving on this thing for me doing my my first boxing fight. I was having hope of being at the Paul, Jake Paul and Woodland fight, you know, card. But the next one is going to be MMA. And maybe in the future, you know, for sure, uh, we'll see, uh, Bellator like to do the co-promoter and they do another event, like together another event. Maybe if Kelly stay in the PFL, maybe we can do this fight happen soon. Then the, the people think about, and this is going to be very exciting. Okay. Wow. Uh, I wasn't even talking about the boxing, but that's very interesting. Were you trying, you were trying to get on the Jake Paul Woodley fight, the fight card? Yeah. Uh, you know, I was being talked, you know, with Scott, I've been talked to Aldi, and now was my next is going to be MMA, but I would like to do my last, uh, more two fights this year, and I would like to one be boxing, and for sure. Were you talking about fighting someone in particular? No, you know, I'm not here for a pick the opponent. Uh, I, you know, it's a new word for me. You know, I'm just coming, new word for me. I just continue training, and... We know who's, we know Adi Atar, and they know Scott Cook, the problem, they're going to work together for see who can be my next opponent in the boxing. But my first one is going to be great. Okay. Um, I know you wanted Katie Taylor. You've been talking about that. Any movement on that from, front? I know. She is calling me out, Katie uh, Taylor. You know? <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I'm just, you know, it, I, it's honor for me she's calling me out. You know, yeah. just continue. Training and you know she's I respect her. She's a really great fighter, 
you know, and let's see what is going to be happen. Uh, I, I've seen you also um, discuss AEW, the wrestling promotion. Is there any talks of you doing any pro wrestling over there? Well, been to, my team been talked to then, you know, for a little bit. And let's see, I, I don't have anything to say now, but I can, I can wait so I can't say anything. And those guys, I, I sent some good news. Oh, okay. So there's something going on, some talks, something, some action? Yeah. You know, I always, I always, you know, we talk for, see, you know, new things coming. You know, I, I like, I like, you know, adventure. I like to learn new things. And let's see. Okay. Wow. Very interesting. Um, how do you feel about all this stuff going on? Like Anderson now doing the boxing, Woodley doing the boxing, Tito doing the boxing, Vitor Belfort doing the boxing. What do you make of all these yes. MMA guys going over to boxing? What does that mean? You know, it's, you know, it's McGregor opened the door for this, you know, and when he did the fight with Mayweather, it's, it's, it's really nice. You know, I, I really, I think there's a lot of people do MMA, like Anderson Silva, like for a long time, he's wanted to do a boxing fight, you know, and finally is now he can have the boxing. He did the second on boxing now and it'd be a great fight. It's, it's cool. The people from MMA can do one box. It's different sport. It is, you know, we have to dedicate to and. But it's, 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 it's going to be for sure. Everyone's going to the box is special. Who do you think wins? Anderson or Tito in the boxing? Because you know, I know you have a relationship with both guys. Who do you think wins the boxing match? You know, it's going to be a tough fight for, I, I, you know, the, the, the pounds. You know, Anderson Silva said they want Tito to make 195 pounds. I think the, the really tough time is, is because how Tito is going to cut. If he's cut, he'll be healthy and then recovery for this fight. I think he's going to be okay, but Anderson's going to be faster than him. But if he's have hard, tough cut, cut, it's going to be hard because it's very bad when you get a dehydrate and getting punched in the head. Mm. What about uh, Jake Paul? How do you feel about him? You know, Jake Paul is having some uh, some boxing fight too. You know, Woodley came from MMA, have a lot of experience, a lot of fights. It's going to be a tough fight. You know, I, I believe the both is, I hope, I hope I watch be tough fight, a great fight for all the fans. You have an NFT coming out, Chris? Yes, my team will work on, and uh, you guys are going to be excited for the next one. You're doing a lot of business, Chris. I, I also got uh, this note um, about an event that you're putting on. Um, I, I want to uh, I want to pull it up here. I want to get this right. Please stand by. Oh, here it is. Um, yes. October 2nd, you're promoting NCF10, which will be an all-women event in honor of breast cancer awareness. It's being held in Brazil, and it's being co-promoted by you and your brother, Rafael, who has a few MMA fights. It's yes. being streamed on ncfights.com and on your YouTube channel. This is something that you've been doing more of. Why are you doing this? You know, I, I like back to my place and back to Brazil, give the opportunity for another, another fighters, you know, be the champion, be you know, different places to go in. Because in the beginning of my career, I have the opportunity to. I have promoted doing small events and can I can have a fight. You know, it's, it's very hard to do events. It's very hard. I would just thank for, for my team and you see fights. Thank you for my brother. He's really working hard for, for making the fights happen. And we did the last Grand Prix, 135 pounds. The champion was Carnisa Silva. And he's, the champion is gonna, is gonna sign me for Bellator. And then we wait Scott Coker in contact before we can do this happen. But in the next event is very special. It's gonna be October Pink. It's gonna be a card all women. And it makes me really happy. Maybe I'm gonna try being present and in person over there. But it's, it's and gonna be support. In Brazil, we have one hospital, the biggest one in Brazil. Maybe America Latina. Uh, the cancer and then godmothers, the, the hospital, and they're going to be supported too. We're going to collect uh, food for help with the, the kids. And, you know, it's going to be great. And I'm very happy for promote the events and help the community. Uh, a couple more things and then I'll let you go, Chris. We have this movie coming out with Halle Berry. Are you a part of it? I know you guys were very tight. Um, that Netflix movie in November. Are you a part of it? You no, know, I was supposed to be a part of it, but if you see a little bit the story about Cats and Gun, I get in close. My story for her is getting close, but I'm not not part of the movie. So you got blocked too from being a part of it? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yes, I am. Come on, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I was, I, I was the first athlete supposed to be in the movie. So I'm the first, the first athlete that Halle Berry came to talk. She was she was movie. in your locker room. Yeah. She was that we saw the pictures and everything. Yes, but you know the, the things change. Wow. Politics. Are you politics, upset? Politics. No, I'm not. I'm not. I was really 
Fox to my career. You know, the opportunity is going to come. I have some movies come out this year and girls are going to go know the news. That is, that is unfortunate. I'm sorry to hear that. I saw Kat is, is suing. Are you going to do the same? No, I'm not. You know, Kat is different. Kat is different. She is supposed to be in the movie and she's like the client on fight to UFC for the movie. And they should get a release from the UFC. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Halle Berry said, man, you can be part of the movie because uh, no UFC had to be UFC fighter. And that's different. For me, it was different. I was not getting released because somebody released me. Now I just wanted to be free and have the news opportunities for me. Okay. Uh, by the way, speaking of Kat, is she your next opponent? No, she's not going to be the next opponent. But the next one, the guy's going to be excited too. I know who it is, but you know I cannot say it. now. I have to wait, Scott. You know, announce the fight. But I'm very excited for the next one. Oh, he doesn't mind if you announce it. It's not that big a deal. Uh, maybe no, he's you, real. <laughs> you think they're going to get mad at you? They love me over there. I mean, they're one of the few promoters. You know, I. I, I have to still sign the contract, but we already know, you know, who she is and the when it's going to be. You guys going to be very excited. Hmm. Is she currently under contract? Hmm. Yes. Yes. Is it Pam Sorensen? Interesting. Pam Sorensen? I'm not going to tell you. Okay. No. Right. Yes, no. Well, I'm looking. No, no, no. You're good. <laughs> I'm looking at the, you, you fought all these people. I mean, Kat was the one. Why isn't Kat the one? I feel like that was the biggest fight. I think she want to do a couple of fights more. I, I don't know, you know, I don't know how, how to her particular life, but I believe in the future for sure. If she's be getting winners and uh, wins and for sure there's problems is going to be close. Who are you going to fight sooner or later? Okay. I think it's Talita Noguera. She froze on us. Perfect timing. It was Scott Coker who did it. Chris, can you still hear me? Oh, we lost her. <laughs> She's getting a call from Scott. Hi. Oh, there you are. All right. I won't uh, I won't keep asking you. Um, Chris, all the best. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. And yeah, don't keep me asking me. It's no No, it's not nice. It's not nice. Uh but Chris, I hope we get to see you versus Kayla Harrison next year. That would be fun. What a big fight. That would be a that would be a mega fight right there. I would love to see that. So uh hopefully that happens. But before then we'll see you. By the way, what month? What month are we going to see? Do you, do, you, do you hear me or no? Maybe this is a sign. Yes, I'm coming back. All right. We'll see you soon, Chris. All the best to Aria. you. See you soon. All right. There thank she you is. so much for the opportunity. See you soon, Aria. Yes, and thank you for your support as well with the return of the MMA Hour. I see it, and I appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Bye. Right. I thank you. There she is, the one and only Chris Cyborg. Could you imagine Chris Cyborg versus uh, hmm. Chris Cyborg versus Kayla Harrison would be big business, if you ask me. Very big business. Interesting time in the sport. A lot of promotions popping up. Last year was a tough year, but I like the way we are uh, currently sitting. All right, so one championship, like I said, on Friday. PFL on Friday. Invicta on Friday, LFA on Friday, a lot to watch on Friday. UFC on Saturday, Edson Barbosa versus Giga Chikadze. Big time fight at 145 pounds. You got the tough finale. You got Kevin Lee against Daniel Rodriguez. Gerald Merchard on the card. Abdul Razak Al Hassan against Alessio De Chirico. Sam Alvey, Dustin Jacoby, JJ Aldrich. Guido Canetti, that's all on Saturday. And then the big Jake Paul versus Tyron Woodley fight, which begins at 8 p.m. Eastern live on Showtime pay-per-view. Oh, I'm, I'm not even gonna say featuring. I'll just be a part of it. And I'm honored to be a part of it. Now, uh, I asked my friends, my subscribers over on my Substack page to hit me up with some questions. Ask the nose. What was the name that I came up with? I came up with a name at the beginning of the show, and I don't remember. From no, it wasn't from the nose. I had a better name. What was the name? Hmm. In any event, it will come to me. 
Anyway, this time I said, all right, you got to be a paying subscriber on the Substack page, arielhawani.substack.com. We're building it up uh, to ask a question. I see that I have a bunch here. And so let's answer some before we call it a week. How about that? Next week going to be a fun one with Darren Till versus Derek Brunson. It's going to be so much to discuss coming off the big weekend. So uh, the train shall roll on. I'll actually be flying in from Cleveland Monday morning and coming straight here because it's a Sunday card. So that's going to be very interesting. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, let's see what we got here. With UFC, this is from Jake Olinar. Olinar, when you, uh, with UFC Fight Pass having a lack of care for their library losing what is one of their best promotions in Invicta, cancellations that often mean no exclusive prelims, and just going on ESPN+, Plus, I feel like the value of Fight Pass is significantly decreasing. Do you agree? I mean, there's a lot of MMA out there. There's uh, UFC on ESPN, which is pretty much every weekend. Now they're putting Contender Series. Now they're putting um, Tough. There's... Bellator on Showtime, there's PFL on ESPN, there's LFA on Access, there's Invicta on Access and Pay-Per-View. There's Cage Warriors on Fight Pass. There's just a lot. Um, clearly, you're a Canadian, excuse me, an American because ESPN Plus is only in America. And so overseas, I would imagine there's still a lot of value because I know some of the cards are on Fight Pass. Kind of reminds me a little bit of the WWE Network they made the deal with Peacock in the States, but if you're in Canada or elsewhere, you still need it. And so I'm not going to advocate to cancel it. Yeah, if you're living in America and you're subbing to Plus and the pay-per-views and Showtime and all that, like you're probably getting your fix and you got Access TV as well. Um, actually, LFA is on Fight Pass. They used to be on Access TV. My apologies you're probably getting enough. I mean, with UFC on every single weekend other than nine weekends out of the year, and then you've got Bellator and PFL, that alone is probably enough for you. But um, I'm not one who like actively goes back and watches some of the old fights. I mean, they've done some good original programming. I'll give them that. And I think that's going to be ultimately uh, a huge thing for them as well. And the library's good. I mean, look, Look what happened with WWE Network. There is a way to package this off and sell it and do it um, in a big way. Now, obviously, WWE Network was its own standalone thing, and they had the pay-per-views there exclusively. ESPN Plus has the pay-per-views, so it's a little different, but it's a moneymaker, and the numbers are up, and they've talked about it. So probably if you're overseas, it's of greater value. Um when it comes this is from L. Gilmore, when it comes to fighters' pay, we've seen some attempts at collectives coming together um, with the intention of tackling the subject. GSP was a high-profile member of the MMAAA, which lasted, what, seven days? These groups, that was my own commentary, these groups just seem to whimper away and die. What do you think stops any momentum or movement created by these groups? Are they scared off? All but slowly, any fighter standing up for the cause distance themselves, and you never hear from it again. Okay, there's a few things here. Number one, the MMAAA came out with Bjorn Rebney, which was a horrible decision, the worst guy possible to put in that spot. Let's just call it like it is. He was the worst choice possible. He was a guy who was not known to be, I have nothing against Bjorn, but he was not known to be fighter friendly. And there he is standing next to those fighters. It felt disingenuous. It felt fake. It felt inauthentic. It felt like he was just trying to, all of a sudden, he's going to stick up for the fighters. He was on the other side. He was part of the problem. Not happening. Um, big names, biggest names possible. It was GSP and Cain Velasquez and Donald Cerrone and TJ Dillashaw. A lot of those guys were CAA guys, so it felt like it was like CAA versus UFC, which uh, kind of lot Cerrone wasn't. So muddied the waters a little bit. The problem was it lost momentum after one day. At, literally after one day, I remember they announced it. End of the year was like December. The next week was UFC in Toronto. And Cerrone's like, nah, I didn't know what I was getting into. Oh, Tim Kennedy was a part of it as well. I don't know what he, and like, you already have a guy who's saying, eh, on second thought, I don't know if I'm going to be a part of this. The whole thing had no legs. And so what I said, what I wrote about yesterday was, there needs to be a collective voice. There needs to be a unified front. 
They need to have a seat at the table. And by the way, if they have the seat at the table and if they have the collective voice and it leads to them getting the amount that they're getting now, the 18%, and they're all happy, then God bless. But the whole point of revenue sharing and collective bargaining is that you are able to say collectively what you want, negotiate, as opposed to saying, hey, no sponsors, here's your deal. Hey, 24-7 drug testing, here are the ter- like. It's just not the way. Oh, hey, here's a crypto company that we're going to put on the uniform. You're not getting a penny. Hey, here's a new TV deal. You're not like, but ultimately, I'll just say it feels like it's the media and some of the fans who complain about this or talk about this or bring light to this more than the fighters. Now, of course, I'm not a dummy. I understand you work for the promotion, not just the UFC, but any promotion. Bellator, I'm sure Bellator fighters, PF, no one's happy, but you're not going to talk about it because you're under contract. I get it. You don't want to rock the boat. And the thing that has always been the issue is, all right, you've got almost like three or four tiers. You've got the top 1% who are living large, who are so far removed from everything else, they're not going to screw things up at this point. You've got the guys who are the champions who are just starting to make the money and they're like, I worked my ass off to get here. I'm not going to rock the boat. You have a guy who's a contender who feels like he's on the cusp of making the money. I'm not going to rock the boat. And then you got the 10,000, 10,000 guys who are like, I'm here. I'm sure as hell not. And so no one wants to rock the boat. No one wants to speak up. So there is no collective voice. Now, there was something called the PFA. They had, uh, you know, um, Jeff Boris, longtime baseball guy, agent, showed up to McGregor Diaz 2 with a shirt and the logo. No one got behind it because there was no, uh, there, there was, there was no momentum. It's very tough. You don't want to be blackballed. And every guy who I spoke about it publicly, eventually does get the pink slip. Now I know what's going to happen now. The MMAFA and their fighters are going to come at me and say, you don't talk about us. First of all, I talk about this. I not, I've lost jobs because I've talked about this and it doesn't even affect me. But as I said to Cajun Johnson yesterday on my Instagram, who kind of came at me and was like, well, we have an organization. We have a collective voice. How many members of your team are on the UFC roster? The voice means nothing. We're talking about a UFC thing here. It's great what you're doing. The class action laws, God bless. I hope it all works out. And it's a worthy, worthy cause. But that's not what I'm talking about right now. Those fighters aren't subjected to the the, the, the uniform deal or the TV deal, the money. It's almost two totally different things. Of course, it's a Venn diagram and there's the middle. But you get what I'm saying. I'm talking about the guys who are under contract. If there was some sort of system where if you fought eight times, you'll be subjected to this pension. And that, there's so much. That's why I always compare this sport to the leather helmet days. That's honestly why I love covering this sport. That's why I love being back here to where I can talk about these things. And I love MMA. Like I said, I've devoted my life to MMA. It's all I talk about. It's all I think about. It's all I read about. It's probably a little bit too crazy how much I think about this crazy sport. But then when you hear Jared Cannonier or Misha Tate, Misha Tate deserves more than $200,000. Are we kidding ourselves? Come on. When you hear them talk about it, when you know how the sausage is made, it's a little disheartening. The fighters deserve more. I don't know how anyone can sit here with a straight face, honestly, and say that they are getting what they are owed, what they are deserving of. 18%, 19%, 20%. It needs to be in the 40s and 50s. And I know it's not as clean and I know it's not as simple as other sports. I'm not trying to pick a fight. I just feel like people need to know that your favorite fighter isn't walking away with all that much or at the very least their fair share seat at the table voice. That's all, but it's tough. It's, it's tough. It might be, I don't think it's happening anytime soon. And I'm not trying to rag on the fighters for that either. I get why it's not happening. It's tough to be that one guy. It's tough to, you know, be Kurt Flood and potentially ruin your career. It is very tough. It's not an easy thing. I can sit here all day long and say I have the I get it. It's super super tough. That doesn't mean it shouldn't happen. That doesn't mean it won't happen. That doesn't mean it doesn't need to happen. It's tough. I get it. We'll be talking about this seems like more people are talking about it, but does anything ultimately happen? Not really. Not right now. Have you ever played Dungeons and Dragons? If so, or even if you haven't, what kind of character would you play as in a fantasy world with elves, 
Wizards Dragons. This is from Chris Gardner. Well, I think I played Dungeons and Dragons when I was a little, little kid. Never was into that fantasy stuff. Never got into Pokemon. Never got into magic cards. I'm a man's man. No, nah, it's just, honestly, I got, I loved wrestling. So you can say what you want about that. Alistair, how dare you? No, nah, Dungeons and Dragons uh, never was my thing. If I had to pick one, probably a dragon. I mean, I feel like the dragon is better than the wizard and the elf, but I don't know. I don't really know if the dragons are not as strong, have weaknesses. Uh, this is from David. What do you make of Eddie Hearn's ambition to make matchroom boxing more like the UFC with greater control over the fighter so he can make more elite matchups? The trade-off between fighter pay against seeing the best versus the best matchup is an interesting debate. You rarely and frequently see best versus best in boxing, but pay is better. You could definitely see that Eddie Hearn is trying to make it more like a UFC. That's better for the fan. I think the event this weekend feels more like a UFC event. That you know, that's a proven commodity. There's a blueprint there. I definitely think that if you are a promoter who's trying to solely make it like the UFC, you're not going to be successful. Witness the fact that Zufa boxing was never a thing, never became a thing. I told you it wasn't going to become a thing because no one's going to let someone come in there and control the way the UFC is able to control MMA because they were the leader. They were there first. That ship has already, it will take years to change the model that is boxing. And yeah, you're right. They do make more. They have more power. They have more leverage. They have more freedom. But it's splintered. So that's why I say I get why fans want everyone under one umbrella. Pro wrestling is a lot more like MMA. There's the dominant, you know, brand. Then there's the other brands, a lot more like MMA. They also don't have any representation any collective voice, which I think they should. I'm all about, listen, you want to accuse me of being biased? The only thing you can truly accuse me of is I want the fighters to get paid as much as possible and get paid more. But by the way, I just want to say, Jake Paul, again, as I was saying last show, I mean, he's turned into a baby face. This guy is getting fighters paid more He's elevating other fighters. He's giving female fighters a platform. I mean, it's hard to hate him right now. He's confusing the public. I can see it. He's confusing them. He's got the whole world eating out of his hand. And I made the comparison to Andy Kaufman. And of course, Andy Kaufman is a legend. But I made the comparison to Andy Kaufman because Andy Kaufman picked a fight with an industry. And that's what Jake Paul's doing. What he's doing is so smart. First, he went after the fellow YouTuber. Check. Then he went after the NBA, and you had Steph Curry and LeBron tweeting about it. Check. Then it's like, oh, I can go after an entire sport. The media is going to cover me more. The fans are going to talk about me more. I could pluck these guys out who don't know how to box as well as I do, who are older than I am, and I could pick a fight with those guys and their leader. And the faces of their organization, check Askren. We'll see on Sunday how it pans out against Tyron Woodley. Oh, and then I'm going to go for Tommy Fury, potentially, and pick a fight with the Fury family and go back to the boxing community. Like The MMA community is covering this more than the boxing community, and that's brilliant because, again, the MMA community and the MMA media core stronger, in my opinion, right now than the boxing media core. And I'm not trying to pick a fight. It's just the way it is. I was at ESPN for three years. Two out of those years, there was no one covering boxing full-time. There's not as much talent out there, at least that I've seen. There's some great guys coming up. Karen Baccia, great guy. My man Dan over at CompuBuck, great guy. A lot of great guys who deserve opportunities. Canobio. But what he's doing is brilliant. It's like Andy Kaufman. He's picking a fight. They're all talking about it. They're all getting riled up. And like Sunday feels like an MMA event, if you ask me. Oh, and they got that. They got the nose involved. Damn. Damn. What would cause you this is from Matt? Oh, Matt. Oh, wait, before I get to the other, the two Matts. Uh, what would your nickname be if you were a fighter slash wrestler? Well, my nickname. 
when I started out in this business, as they say in the pro wrestling business, was the franchise. I worked on a radio show called In the Ring on CFMB 1280 AM in Montreal. And the host of the show was a guy named Aaron Amadeus. And he said, you're the franchise because you're the future. Now, this is the year 2000. I was 18, 17 turning 18. And so I've always said that if I fought, I'd be the franchise. This is from another Matt. Shout out to Shane Douglas, by the way, the franchise. What would cause you to turn your back on MMA? The long-term health impact on fighters, as exemplified by this year's Spencer Fisher story. Great job by Stephen Morocco here at MMA Fighting. Heartbreaking story, but great reporting. And uh, the ongoing fighter pay issues make me feel pretty complicit in exploiting these athletes I root for. If more stories about the fighters who brought me into the sport start to emerge, I think I'll have to stop being a fan, right? Or am I being over the top? And the fact that fighters choose this lifestyle makes it just okay enough for all of us to keep watching. So this is sort of like what I was talking about when you know how the sausage is made. It's tough. Ultimately, why am I still doing this? I started really in 2006 doing this for a living. Why am I still doing this? And I can't believe it's been 15 years. I do it for the fighters. Now, I don't feel like I'm doing it for the fighting fighters. What I mean is talking to them, learning more about them, the Brendan Locke names, the Kevin Hunt, like those stories and how accessible they are, how open they are, how vulnerable they are at times. I love that. You don't get that in any other sport. You, don't, you can't even get a show like this in any other sport. There is no show like this in any other sport. Show me one. Name one. Name one where you get these names on in their respective sport, each and every show doesn't exist, doesn't exist. And so that's why I still love it. I like the fighters more than the fights. Of course, I love the fights, but it's like what keeps me going in my heart. What makes me want to get a new job doing this, that it's the fighters. That excites me, talking to them, interviewing them. If I could do that for the rest of my days. But I'll, I, I, I won't lie to you. Like I've read about Howard Cosell towards the end of his days. Howard Cosell hated boxing, turned on boxing, felt like it ruined his friend's life, Muhammad Ali. And now as we're getting older and we're seeing the guys that we grew up with, the guys who helped us fall in love with the sport, the Spencer Fisher, so those great fights with Sam Stout, Chuck Liddell, BJ Penn. And you're starting to see those guys and the state that they're in and what they've been left with. That's why I talk about fighter pay now. That's why I talk about them getting what they're owed now. I hate to be a, a broken record here, but that's why. Because the window is so small and because they're left with nothing. So I get it. I get feeling weird. I would say still support them. The bigger the sport gets, the more money that they'll get as well eventually, we hope. And uh, it's okay to have mixed feelings but they're great people and they deserve our, our support. What's the greatest risk you've taken in your career? This is from Brodo. And by the way, I love these questions. These are great questions. Uh, greatest risk I've taken in my career. Man, probably the greatest risk that I've taken thus far in my career was I worked to get a job at Spike TV. And um, this is 2007. I was working in TV production. They were the home of the UFC and I thought this is the perfect place for me, production, UFC, that stuff all together and then i get there i'm there one week i went to go uh i went to las vegas dean thomas was fighting kenny florian i believe and uh we did absolutely nothing and i realized after a week this isn't the job for me there's nothing for me to do and so i walked into my boss's office brian diamond and i said uh, this job isn't for me i'm really sorry but i would like to leave and he told me that this was the biggest mistake of my life and that I would regret it forever, and that I was unprofessional, and that uh, this wasn't the way business was conducted. But I knew in my heart this wasn't the job for me. And so they made me stick around for a month and a half until they found someone to replace me, and that's when I started my site, jerrypark.com, and that's when I started reaching out to fighters on MySpace, and that's when I started interviewing them because I realized that's the crossroads of my life. 25, I got to go for this. I got to interview fighters. I want to cover this sport. 2007, 2008. It's growing. It's getting interesting. UFC, Elite XC, IFL, Strike Force. And uh, it was a risk. I gave myself six months. I said from October to April 1st, 
If I don't get a job in that six month period, I'll go back to TV production. And luckily with three days left, it's kind of crazy. My wife is actually calling me right now on FaceTime with three days left on my, um, on my deadline with three days left on her birthday, no less. I got a job at MMA rated. And so that was a big risk in that period. I actually got engaged to my wife in that period. I had nothing. I had no job. I had no income, but I wanted to take a chance. Thank the good Lord. It all panned out. Uh, L Gilmore, you mentioned that Brock is the most intimidating individual you've ever had to interview. What fighter or personality completely exceeded or surpassed any expectation you had of them prior to meeting and interviewing them? Your infamous interview with The Undertaker at UFC 121 is one I can think of where viewers got to see the man behind the persona. All right, so there's a ton here because I've obviously had the good fortune to interview a ton. The first one that just came to mind now, back in the old days, the Brian Park days of this show, the MMA Hour, Stone Cold Steve Austin came in studio. Now, I know he's not a fighter, but it's just the first one that came to mind. In studio... And I couldn't believe how down to earth he was, how humble he was. He came alone. He came early. He was very gracious with his time. It was an absolute joy. So that's one that was like, wow, The Rock also. I mean, honestly, you meet most of them. Like, they're all really good, kind, down to earth people. There are very few a-holes. There are very few bad guys. There are very few mean guys. There are very few re rude guys or gals. Um, so I've never really had, you know, sometimes you walk away and you're like, hmm, that wasn't great. But for the most part witness the fact that I'm still around 15 years later. They've been all great and very enjoyable. Back in your life, this is Mike. From the sounds of it, with Gable Steveson, the UFC hasn't been out front trying to secure him. Do you have any thoughts on that? Coming off an Olympic gold medal, win like his, and the popularity he's been gaining? This would be a huge get for the UFC in the heavyweight division. Wouldn't he be easier to negotiate with now before he goes to WWE or another organization and becomes a bigger star? Keep up the awesome work. Thank you. UFC ain't going to be chasing him. They're not going to play that game. Honestly, if I'm Bellator, I get him under the same kind of deal that they had with Aaron Pico. Let him go wrestle, pay him a little stipend, and you secure the fact that when he is ready, he comes over to you. You put him in your, your system, your farm system, if you will. I would do that. But it sounds to me like the picture with Vin Vince ain't taking a picture with you if you're not coming over. That's just my read on the situation. No inside knowledge there. Just my read. Dana's not meeting with him. I mean, it just feels like it's right there. He's front and center. He's in the ring, like they're rolling out the red carpet for him. And so I feel like he's going to go there. But if I'm Bellator, I try to get him in the farm system like I did with Pico. And I know the Pico thing didn't really work out. UFC has done some developmental deals, but not to the point of uh, you know paying a guy like that who hasn't fought. Bellator has. So I would consider that. But I'm not surprised they're not going after him. It's it's not really their thing. Their thing is get a few fights and then come to us. Jake, Ariel, which is the best regional MMA territory to check out right now in the United States? Mine is CFFC. Great one. Uh, that is a good one. Ring of Combat, another one. Cage Warriors has made its debut, but they're obviously not known as an American promotion. Um, mainly in Europe, KSW Europe, USA, LFA, of course, probably the one that has produced the most stars to come over to the UFC Invicta. You'd have to put them in that bucket right now. Those are probably the ones. Ariel, in five years, where do you see MMA and how about 10? The sport is trending in the right direction. With the rise of gambling, with the rise of ESPN, their notoriety on ESPN, and these other promotions, like it is trending in the right direction. Make no mistake about it. We could talk all we want about the lack of stars and this guy losing and that person losing. Sports gambling being legal all over the place is huge for the UFC, huge for MMA. All of these sports books, gigantic. DraftKings, FanDuel, BetMGM. Caesars, all these places, 
It's great. It's a great sport to bet on. It's a very easy sport. Every Saturday, you pick your fighters, your parlays, all that. It's been huge for it. Uh, ESPN, huge for it. Showtime getting back, huge for it. So uh, I think the sport is going to be in a big spot. The, the, to, honestly, the biggest story to watch over the next few years is this whole fighter pay thing. Like, does anything change? Are we going to see co-promotions and all that? Probably not. Not going to happen. But that, to me, is the one to watch. And I've, I've often said we're maybe 20, 30 years from it really changing, as depressing as that sounds. Maybe I'm being way too conservative. Maybe it's 5, 10 years. Josh, I saw a lot of WWE coverage this weekend. Are we going to get any AEW coverage on these feeds? CM Punk, CM Punk, CM Punk. This is what he wrote. Uh, I did reach out to CM Punk, and he said he was laying low with the media stuff. So, of course, I would love to have him on. Uh, but he's laying low with the media stuff, and I thought his promo was great and totally respect that. He was very nice about it all, and um, I'm, I'm rooting for those guys. I, I hope that uh, I, I want everyone to succeed. Rising tide lifts all boats. Look at the late 90s, WCW, WWF, better. And I hope we can get that sort of thing in um, in MMA. Troy Farkas, my old producer, TST on the page. How about that? Who should Jake Paul fight if he beats Woodley? Tommy Fury. If Tommy Fury beats Anthony Taylor, which a lot of people think he will, got to be Tommy Fury. It's right there. It's right there. Honestly, it's right there. It's the great storyline. He'll be on the same card. The stars are aligning. It's the Furies. It's a boxer. Not that many fights. He'll have seven fights. That's the one. Same size. He's got the social media following. My sister said she loved him on Love Island with Miss Molly May. All that thing. You got John Fury involved. You got Tyson Fury involved. You got the Pauls who can promote better than anyone. That's the one. Now, if he loses, it gets a little weird. But I would like to see a non I mean, it's... There's only one. It's Tommy Fury. Um, with John Jones taking what is likely going to end up being a two-plus-year hiatus, do you still believe that he is the number one pound-for-pound -pound fighter in the world, or do you think it should be relinquished to Kamar Usman? I think Usman should get it. Now that Habib is gone, it should be Usman. He has been the most uh, active. Uh, I thought John lost to Dominic Reyes, even though you want to give him the win. Like You don't fight for a year. I've always said, tough to be ranked. I hope we see him back. These are important years, important days. Hope to see him back, but I would go uh, probably Usman Izzy right now is one, two. Um, any chance of you interacting with Luke Thomas this week with uh, you both working with Jake Paul and Woodley or the Jake Paul Woodley fight? It would be great to see you guys bury the hatchet. No hatchet here. I don't know if he's going to be there. I don't know what his um, duties are, but I would shake his hand. No, no hard feelings here. Said some things about me. I don't care. Um, life is too short for any of that. So no hard feelings here, and I got no hatchet here. Um, no hatchet to bury, of course. Uh, Christopher, as I was reading your latest nose article, it dawned on me, when are you going to start writing your autobiography? Can't wait to read it. Highway to Helwani, coming soon. Barnes Noble. I need to start working on that. Boy, do I got a lot to talk about. A lot of stuff that I haven't told you all about, and I feel like I've told you a lot. And someone keeps, a friend of mine keeps telling me I need to start writing things down, voice notes, all this stuff. I haven't gone there yet, but I probably should. Before it's all said and done, I want to do it. Highway to Helwani. Is that the right name? I don't know, but it's the name that always comes to mind. Uh, Matthew, what do you regret the most in your career? Tough question. Kind of falls into the Highway Helwani thing. Really only one answer, and I've talked about it, the Fox thing getting paid by UFC, biggest regret of my career. It's only it's it's the only regret that I have, really. Um, every move, every zig, every zag, I can live with them all. I knew in my heart I shouldn't have done it. I fought it. I lost. I still did it. I should have followed my heart. I should have listened to myself. Easy to say now. It was a big opportunity five years there on TV, but I just never, ever, ever, ever felt comfortable with it. I went to Syracuse University, the best damn journalism school, in the country and that was day one stuff and i will regret that for the rest of my life and i i i justified it by saying oh the money's coming from fox and family and all that i just should have stayed away should have stayed away um as we just passed the five-year anniversary of the ufc this is from varine 
just a couple more here under the WME IMG regime. How would you grade WME IMG as stewards of the sport? And how will history view the decision by the Fertitas to sell the UFC in 2016, given the new heights the company reached with ESPN post sale? It's fine. They're shrewd. They're smart. More ads than ever on the, uh, the, the, the mat and, um, you know, they made some business decisions and, you know, they benefited from the pandemic and having the events at apex. That was a very smart move. That was started by the old regime, um, cut costs, made a lot of money. The one thing I'll say is they always told us back in the day, it'll never be like boxing. It'll never be just one fight and a bunch of other fights. And the cards are feeling more and more like the boxing cards that they used to criticize. They being the old brass. Um, but you know, things have changed. I mean, a lot of these cards are quite thin and it's not, it used to be UFC is on, I'm coming over. Now it's UFC is on, who's fighting? Well, I'll just wait for next week. But they're making hand over fist. The relationships with all the TV partners are great. And so who can, who can honestly criticize them? But yeah, it's different. It's a different, it's a different organization. It's a different sport. It's a different model. What is your top five pound for pound OAT? I don't know if that's a troll. Top five, is that goat? Did he mean to write Geo Anderson? Okay, well, there's two. There's two. There's two lists. There's the PD list and the non PD list. And what I mean by that is like, did they fail ever in their career? Then they can't be on the non PD list. If it's the non PD list, it's GSP. It's Demetrius Johnson. It's uh, it's Daniel Cormier. It's Fedor. Who am I missing? If it's the other one, it's those guys, but it's also John Jones, it's Anderson Silva. Um, those are the names. Greatest of all time, my opinion, is George St. Pierre. Because he never failed, because he avenged his two losses. All right, one more, one more. Let's see here. Okay, here it is. What fighter do you think you have the greatest chance beating in a three-round fight? Are you kidding me? I can't beat any of these people. They're unbelievable athletes. They've got, they possess DNA that I can't even dream of possessing. Can't even dream of possessing. Stepping in a cage, naked, essentially, with just shorts, a cup, four-ounce gloves. I can't even dream of that. They have courage that I will never have in my life. So I don't want to disrespect any fighter on the planet by saying that I could beat them. Wouldn't even allow myself to go there. Wouldn't even allow myself to dream that. Get whooped by all of them. So the answer is no fighter. Now, anyone, I would say probably Dylan Dennis. Yeah, I would say probably Dylan Dennis. All right. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who wrote in. Arielhawani.substack.com. I appreciate all the uh, love and support. I'm just kidding, Dylan. Calm down before you get all crazy over there on the social media. I mean, every post, every post, every post. Much love. Nursing the bum knee. Hope he gets well soon. We miss Dylan Dennis in the sport of MMA. Um, and, you know, I don't know if the, the, the ship sailed on the Jake Paul stuff would be fun. Um, but we'll see how it all pans out. We're about to find out the next chapter in this whole thing on Sunday. And so on that note, we shall leave it all at that. Frank, you can hit my music. What a fun day it has been. I like I like ending this, you know, starting to get into a groove here, right? We're starting to get into a groove with the questions, with the shows. I like ending the week, if you will, the back-to-back -back shows with, uh, with some questions. I like that. It's a nice way to end the week as we prepare for what is to come. And so I want to thank everyone who stopped by today. And most importantly, I want to thank all of you who continue to support, watch, download, subscribe. Shout out to the YouTube chat, the cesspool. Shout out to all the guests this week. It's been a great week. Week two in the books. Shout out to my main man, Robert Pearson. Robert S. Pearson who's making those great graphics, Hollywood, Kiawani. Uh, I was a little I was a little more tame this week, right? I wasn't shooting as much. 
I don't, you know, people getting their feelings hurt. I wasn't shooting as much. But don't think I don't have it in my back pocket, ready to fire away if need be. But I'm just trying, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be cool with everyone. I want, I, I come in peace. I come in peace. Peace and love. Peace and love. Thank you very much to the great Brendan Lochnane. Good luck to him on Friday at PFL as he tries to get that million dollars. Thank you very much to Kevin Lachlan. Kevin Lachlan, shout out to him. He used to work here. Kevin Holland. Uh, good luck to him in his training. Thank you very much to AJ McKee. I'll see you this weekend. Thank you very much to Misha Tate. Thank you very much to Chris Cyborg as well. And thanks to all of you. Back next week. Same time and place. Until then, I say peace. I'm out of here.